and I am so happy today to be able to interview a former Catholic who had spent many years in Catholicism and now has a great love for Catholics to reach out and uh, it's lovely to have you Will on the program. I remember briefly as I grew up in the church you know going through like the stations of the cross and that having a very deep impression on me um, you know feeling bad for Jesus that he suffered the way he did and uh, I had a very good relationship with the priest there probably one of my fathers was a gentleman named Monsignor Echo and he was very well loved in the area and in the neighborhood and um, that was my earliest recollection. Yeah, I, re I remember thinking to myself what it might be like to be a priest because I felt that uh, even in even in my earliest years, I remember having a desire to know God more personally, and I would do anything within my power to do that. And, uh, and I thought that perhaps by becoming a priest, that might be the avenue to, to fulfill that desire. And uh, can you remember the day of First Communion itself? Do you remember what it was like going up for First Communion? Uh, can I, remember? I remember I was very nervous. <laughs> Uh, and excited at the same time because for me it felt like I was taking the next step of drawing closer to God and um, being afraid to make a mistake and and then after taking the wafer and the juice I, I felt like something I, like I had received uh, forgive me if I say this you know a scout badge or something like that um, that I was just that much closer to God, and then from then on, I could be one of the people that received that, that went forward to receive that, and I was very excited. In thinking back on why I became an altar boy, it's, it's, it's hard to remember. I do remember, though, serving as an altar boy. Uh, again, uh, as I stated earlier, you know, I desired to have such a close relationship with God, and I was working towards that, and so this was just the next phase and I'm trying to remember how I was approached uh, in becoming an altar boy because obviously, you know, and, and I don't know if there was a line of young boys that wanted to do this, but I know I had a desire to serve and to be closer to the priest because that was the, the place to be because he was close to God. And so um, I remember wearing the robe, you know, going in the back, being, it was special for me because I felt I was different than everybody else. I felt that I was somehow, and you'll have to forgive me, that much closer. What are your memories of being holy or pious? Mm. And uh, mm. the, were you a holy, pious young boy? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, how in, did it in my show? own eyes. How was, did it show? Uh, <laughs> well, it uh, early. Uh, it started with uh, reading the or saying the rosary. I remember I would sit for hours in uh, my favorite rocking chair and I would rock back and forth and I would go through the rosary and I would try and do that as much as possible because again I felt that by the amount of time I spent in, in saying the rosary that God would be pleased with me. My, um, and again I don't know how many other people think this way but my, my early impressions of uh, how I felt that God would judge me was I pictured, and, and of course, you know, you've got to consider the fact that I was a, a young child, <clears throat> that there was an angel assigned to me, and there was a big chalkboard, and one side said good, and one side said bad, and he would put a chalk mark next to what was good, or put a chalk mark next to what was bad, and I felt that the more good I would do, and, and part of that was saying the rosary, um, that that would outweigh the bad, and that in the, in the end, when I faced God on Judgment Day, that he would tally up the, the count and, and hopefully uh, the good would outweigh the bad and, and then he would let me into the kingdom and uh, I, would, I would go to service every day. It would be like I'd get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, walk across the street and down the hill to the church and I would sit in service and I would pray to God and ask him to help me to be a good Christian. Mm -hmm. In thinking back, uh, my life and growing up as a Roman Catholic and uh, you know praying to saints and to Mary and um, others 
it's, I, I realize now that really I, I never really read my Bible all that much. I trusted those who were in authority to teach me the truth and, and I took their word for granted. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we did not, of course, read the Bible either, but we uh, did read the uh, Catechism, you know what I mean? Yes. Uh, and we memorized the Catechism. Uh, I remember uh, memorizing why we prayed for souls in purgatory, you know, in the Catechism. It's a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from their sins. That's the answer, you know? Well, as I, I grew older and I began to hang out with, uh, you know, the other teens and everything, and uh, we would go to church on our own, uh, we would, uh, instead of, because in the, as you grow older and you, you begin to um, hang out with the, the other teenagers, they seem to cloister in the back, and so there was a spot where the teenagers hung out in the back that was the cool area, and so we didn't really go in to uh, sit with the, the other members. We would hang out in the back, and, you know, we would, as long as we were there, that's what was important. And uh, earlier, uh, I was in the choir. I didn't mention this earlier, but I had a great time. I sang with the choir in the back of the church, but as I got older, I felt you know, a little more embarrassed. As a, as a young man, uh, it, it wasn't cool. So I stopped doing that, and then I hung out with everybody in the back. But um, as I began to grow and question things and actually start to listen to the service as it went on, I became disheartened with not so much what was being said, but what wasn't being said. So I know that now you're in ministry and you preach and teach. Yes, sir. So um, when did you actually you come to biblical salvation? Was it some years later that you really saw what salvation was? And can you explain what it was like when you saw in the scripture um, what salvation really is, you Absolutely. know, what the condition, what is our condition before God and uh, how it was that the Lord showed you the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Could you explain uh, that? It, uh, we move all the way up to when I was 19 years old and um, I was doing carpentry and uh, working for a contractor, uh, building homes from the ground up. And there was a gentleman there that uh, we would talk about things, and he would ask me questions. Simple questions like, you know, do you believe in God? I'd say, yeah, sure, you know. And, uh, you know, I, 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 even at that time I thought it was foolish not to believe in God. And so he would, his questions became more and more personal to the point where, you know, he asked me if I knew that if I were to die, today that I would go to heaven and I said well that's not up to me that's God's choice I don't know I don't know if I'm good enough I don't know if I'm bad enough not to go and I said that's totally up to God not up to me and he said well that's not quite true yeah and so he began to share with me certain things that I'd never heard before and we hung out and it was later on um, that I began to visit other churches other than Roman Catholic churches. Uh, I became curious. And so I, uh, I, I went around the, the gamut of uh, the different churches I visited all, anyway, anywhere from, from Pentecost to the Charismatic to conservative Baptist churches and so on. But uh, at 19 I visited a church and I heard the gospel message for the very first time. And at the end of the service, uh, the gentleman asked us to bow our heads and close our eyes, and he said that uh, if there's anyone here that doesn't know if when they die they're going to heaven and would like to know, raise your hand. So I raised my hand. I was an honest individual even then. And uh, a gentleman took me down in another room and explained to me the gospel. And uh, typically today we call it, you know, the prayer of salvation. I prayed and. Um, to be honest with you, uh, at that time I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and even though I prayed the prayer, I felt like something happened. But I did not live a life according to that confession. Well, I think it's so important that you say this because there are um, so many people who have, um, you know, um, 
done the same sort of thing they've gone through sort of a ritual and they've said the sinner's prayer yes. and uh, they wonder why it didn't take it was like <laughs> and I think from from Catholics uh, you know that you know are searching and looking uh, that this can be deceptive you know whereby at churches it says all you've got to do is come forward make your decision yes. uh, sign the card say you've accepted Christ into your heart and everything and it's uh, yes. And I struggled, even as an unsaved priest, with the very same thing of false professions where people, you know, have been led into sinners' prayers sure. and uh, where they have not been genuine. So I, I'm really happy you said that because we do not want uh, precious Catholic people to uh, be told that, you know, all it takes then is to say the sinner's prayer and, you know, now, now yes. we have another ritual that we've yes, got to I know. And I it's know. not... It's all, so it's good that you said that. So how yes. eventually did you get convicted before the All-Holy God that uh, you really were a sinner because you only saved sinners? Absolutely. And how was it that by God's grace through faith that you really were saved? Yes, well, that's pretty interesting. Um, it was, I would say, from that period on, from when I was 19 on, after I, I mouthed the words to the sinner's prayer, that uh, I began to feel convicted. It was almost as if um, the door to my conscience was finally open, and and I believe it was at the age of 25. I couldn't take it any longer. The um, the conviction I felt for the lifestyle I lived and and sinning before a holy God bore down on me so great that the the climax came one evening that uh, I was reading my Bible <clears throat> and the Lord just brought it out uh, so uh, illuminating the fact that if I were to die that I would suffer an eternal torment in hell um, because I rejected God, I sinned against a holy God and that at that time God revealed to me that He was offering Christ's sacrifice on my behalf to pay the penalty for my sins that Christ I understood that Christ's whole life was lived in obedience to God on my behalf and that his sacrifice was to pay the penalty for the sins in other words when I looked at the law the Ten Commandments which terrified me my whole life you know, I talked about the angel with the chalkboard, and I looked at the Ten Commandments as the great equalizer, and I saw that Christ's life was lived to obey God on my behalf because that was something I couldn't do. He did it for me, and not only that, did He obey the law, but also He took the law's penalty on my behalf that the soul that sinneth shall die. And when I understood that, when the, the light, I call it the light of the gospel, broke through on my conscience, it was then and there that I bowed my heart to God and believed that Christ had done it on my behalf. He, his, he was my substitute. He took my place. I deserved to, to be on that cross. It should have been me that was whipped. It should have been me that was crowned with the thorns. But it was Christ who did it on my behalf. I'm sorry. He that knew no sin became sin yes. for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Christ Jesus, who knew no sin, He became legally sin. Yes. He took our sin upon Himself. Like the Apostle Peter said, He took our sins on His body on the tree. Yes. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. We may be clothed in His righteousness. And it is enough to bring tears to your eyes oh. as it is to yours now. You really have been convicted and you really trust on Christ and that you really are born again yes. by the Spirit. How was it after that? Uh, I felt like a completely different person. Uh, the things that, the sins I had committed prior to that really didn't convict me as much as now <clears throat> I, uh, with the conscience being opened by the Spirit of God now all of a sudden you know we talk about little sins and big sins all sin 
was equal. There was no little sin, there was no big sin. And uh, I became convicted very easily and uh, confessed my sin straight to God as soon as uh, the sin was committed. I mean, I didn't become sinless, obviously, but my desire for holiness grew. My desire to trust Christ more grew. My desire to grow in grace grew. The, the things that I did, the, the, um, the works that I did were no longer done to earn God's favor, but they were done as if to say thank you. Um, they were a, um, a result yes, of the yes. salvation. We had uh, one more child, but we had a few misses in between. And the amazing thing about it, though, is uh, with the relationship between my wife and I, because we're both Christians now, is that before, if something bad happened to us, we would question why. It just it didn't make sense to us. Why is God angry with us? Why is He putting us through this? And it was later, after we both uh, committed our hearts to the Lord and, and by God's grace He opened up our heart to believe the Gospel that we viewed things differently than that God as a loving Heavenly Father does all things good and probably the passage that is most precious to me is in Romans chapter 8 verse 28 where Paul says and we know that all things work for good to those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose and I realize that that purpose which the next verse talks about is that we be predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And I thought, what a great purpose. And there's no one I'd rather be like than Christ. And that's the purpose that he's working through in our hearts. And so when things began to happen, like my wife, I believe, had roughly three miscarriages before my, my youngest son was born. And where in the past it would have been devastating, now we say God does all things good, all things well. And that if, if this happened, then it was for our good. Yes, it's a whole different mindset where you see yes. things from God's point of view and as the scripture speaks, you know, and, and that all things work for good. I know I've fallen back on that. Romans 8.28 text yes. many times and the, the reason for Romans 8.28.29 that we will be conformed, mm -hmm. shaped more and more like to Christ Jesus. What would you say to that Catholic person now, at the present time? Absolutely. One of the things that I would say is the greatest question that anyone can have answered in their lifetime is how can a sinner be made right before a holy God? And the answer to that question is probably the greatest answer you'll ever hear. The person who responds, the reason I'm going to heaven is because I'm a Roman Catholic, needs to understand that it was Christ himself who gave himself as a sacrifice for sin. Uh, it is not whether you belong to a denomination, whatever denomination it may be, whether you're Roman Catholic, whether you're Lutheran, whether you're Baptist, whether you're Presbyterian, or any other denomination, for the denomination did not, was not nailed to the cross. Some people say, well, it's my faith that saved me. Well, your faith was not nailed to the cross either. It was Christ and Christ alone. The, probably the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16, uh, the Gospel according to St. John says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then later in that same Gospel, the Bible says, He that has the Son has everlasting life. He that does not have the Son, the wrath of God abides upon Him. So we come into this world then as sinners before a holy God. We are already under God's wrath. It's not that one day we'll stand before God and God will outweigh our good with our bad, as I spoke of earlier with the, the angel and the chalkboard. We're already on the negative side. We're, we come in not only with our own sin, but with the sin of Adam. And because of that sin, and because of our nature, the Bible says we are, by our natures, children of wrath. We stand before a holy God condemned. And yet God in His gracious love and in His mercy, the Bible says that God demonstrates His love and that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. And the Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It is all in Christ. And therefore, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, those who are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The condemnation is removed because the Bible says that it is Christ himself who bore God's wrath on our behalf. And the person who trusts Christ alone for eternal life, who believes that Christ took their place on the cross at Calvary, that Christ bore their sins, God recognizes that as having been done in their place. And he accounts them as not guilty. Justification. You are not guilty because Christ has borne your penalty on your behalf for you. And the, the beautiful transaction is in justification that, number one, your sins are transferred to Christ, and number two, his righteousness is transferred to you, and God sees you as righteous in his sight through Christ Jesus. When Peter and John stood before the, the Sanhedrin, and they, they told them, they, they adjured them not to speak of the name of Christ, and they spoke back and said, we must obey God rather than men. And the, the fact of the matter is, uh, you have to ask yourself the question, is it your love for your own personal um, uh, welfare or your love for even a church or your membership more important than your love and obedience for God? Uh, we talk about the Ten Commandments. and. I have come to the conclusion that all sin is basically a breaking of the first commandment, which is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So anybody who, who has a heart that says, well, I, I desire more to be um, to healthy, more to be uh, comfortable, rather than have to give up everything for the sake of what you're saying, well, what you're actually saying then is you're breaking the first commandment because you love something more than God. You have an idol which needs to be removed. It is good to be with you again, and I am really happy to be able to interview somebody who was, has been in Desert Storm and served as a Marine in going to Bosnia. It has been a desire of mine for a long time to interview somebody who has been involved in these recent conflicts and particularly somebody who has a heart and a desire to reach out in love to precious Catholic people and comes from a Catholic background. So I'm happy today to introduce to you Ralph Di Cosimo uh, and Ralph I'd like to ask you something of your background as you grew up. Sure, I uh, grew up in a Italian-American, very Catholic family. Uh, I was baptized as an infant, raised in the Catholic faith. Uh, I went to Catholic school from the time of kindergarten. I received uh, my sacraments in the way which I was supposed to, uh, penance and uh, communion in second grade and uh, confirmation. I went on to uh, a Catholic high school and uh, I would have considered myself very much a devout Catholic, even after the time when my mother stopped making me go to church. I continued to go on my own. I went to church every Sunday. Uh, I went to confession regularly. Uh, I received the sacraments as I felt I was supposed to. I followed the uh, Lenten practices and I observed the Holy Days of Obligation. And You know, in short, I had considered myself a devout Catholic and I very much loved the Catholic faith and uh, I had never heard anything other than it. Uh, a turning point in my life that really started to change things. Change didn't take effect immediately, but uh, while I was in the Marines, I had several uh, trying experiences. Uh, I went through Desert Storm, and uh, I wore a rosary around my neck while I was in Desert Storm, and I would, you know, pray to God to protect me, and uh, say the rosary to Mary, and I came out of Desert Storm alive and well, and I felt very, even more attached to my roots. Uh, about a year after that, uh, while uh, we were, while my unit was in the Mediterranean, we went to Bosnia when the situation there was first 
starting to get going around uh, late 92, maybe very early 93, um, and our ship went to Bosnia. And we were stuck on ship, waiting off the coast of Bosnia to go in as a strike force if necessary. Um, th that never did happen, but while we were there, we were on ship and couldn't get off for several months. And I met a couple of young Marines like myself who uh, identified themselves to me. Uh, we got to talking. I don't really remember how we met each other or really got to talking the first time, but they said that uh, they were born-again Christians. And, uh, and I said, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian too. I'm Catholic. And uh, they were very non-judgmental, and uh, we got to talking, and something impressed me about these two young guys that uh, I had never been exposed to anything but Catholicism. I grew up in a Catholic family. I went to Catholic school. Um, I had never been taught to challenge anything, and uh, I very much held the priests in awe, and whatever they said, I believed, and I believed that they were men of God. and. But I really lived my life for myself. Uh, I went to church and I did the things I was supposed to do as a Catholic, but I wasn't living a life for God, uh, although I didn't know that then. But these gentlemen, their life was different. Their life, they were single-minded in purpose, and I could see that they were different from me. And we started to look in the Bible, and they started to show me things in the Bible that I had never seen before, and I had never read before. And they planted seeds that made me start to really think. I felt that what kind of separated Catholicism from all of what I classified as the Protestant religions, those other religions, uh, was that the Roman Catholicism contained the Catholic priesthood. And I really felt that was the essence of uh, Christianity, that the priests were the successors of the apostles, and they were the only ones that uh, were rightly in that position. And they could dispense the sacraments and that we would get grace by these things if I, in, for instance, if I didn't have the priesthood, how would I get my sins forgiven? If I committed a mortal sin, I believe that, you know, a mortal sin, yeah, I have to go to confession to have that forgiven. And I felt the need for the priest and I felt like that they were men of God and that uh, through them I stayed connected with God. And I've kind of viewed Protestant pastors as kind of renegades as these men who just <laughs> were up there preaching uh -huh. and they had a Bible and they kind of were self-ordained men and weren't really men that didn't want to be part of the true faith and went out there on their own. And that was my opinion of them. Uh, and uh, Catholic school very much helped to form that opinion in me that that's exactly what they were. They were separated from the true faith. I saw a tremendous contrast and that was the first thing that made me think. Uh, I had met Protestants, but the Protestants I had met were lukewarm in their faith, as I was. Uh, but these, these young gentlemen were very much different. They were very devoted to God. They looked to the Bible only uh, for their source of truth. And uh, the, what, what the sacraments did do for me is they made me self-righteous. They made me feel good about what I was doing. I would receive communion and I felt like I fulfilled an obligation. I would go for confession and I would say to my mind, I got that out of the way, now I'm good, and, you know, I could build up some more sins and then I'll just go again. And, but it didn't change my life whatsoever. I gave God an hour on Sundays and the rest of the week was for me and I did whatever I wanted and I looked at whatever I wanted to on TV and in magazines and pursued the lifestyle I wanted to. But these men were, I could see, they, were not, they weren't judgmental, but I could just see how they carried themselves and the way they lived and the way they spoke. I could tell that they were different than me and that they said they were Christians and I said I was a Christian, but we were very different and made me think one of us was not. Well, after the Marines, I was looking forward to going to college, and I uh, used the GI Bill uh, mm -hmm. from the military to put me through a city college, and uh, and uh, I kind of went on my everyday life, and nothing really changed, but the uh, gentleman that I met when I was on ship in the Marines planted seeds in me that 
I never really forgot about, and I would think of some of the things that they said, and I would look at some of the scriptures that uh, they gave me from time to time, and uh, I was searching. And so my reaction was to draw closer to the Catholic faith. I started to seek answers with priests that I knew. I would, I went to lunch with a uh, priest that was very close, who uh, is a the theologian, teaches theology at the university, and uh, asked questions. And uh, I uh, started to go to church very often during the week. And I thought by drawing closer to the Catholic faith, this would ease some of the unrest that I started to feel in me. I started to feel that there was a difference between these true Christians that I met in myself and, and the way they came to truth and the way I did. I saw that the way they came to truth was very objective, that they would look at the scripture and conform their life to obey it. And I saw once I started to reading the Bible that my version of truth was I would listen to my church and try to make it fit into what the Bible said, kind of like putting a square peg in a round hole. And I tried to find more and more ways to make the two relate to each other. And I had this growing feeling of unrest. Well, when were you actually convicted that you were a sinner and that you had to trust on Christ alone? Did that come while you were in college? Or was it after you left college? Or when was it? That happened while I was in college. There were a couple of gentlemen I met that ran... Uh, uh, Bible study group uh, on campus and they invited me to attend and I said oh sure you know I'd love to look at the Bible and uh, you know I felt that I could adequately defend my faith and I went to a few of the Bible studies and I went to one or two of their services that they had and I got to talking with them and I talked to one of the uh, gentlemen at the church who was kind of like a Bible study leader he became a deacon uh, in that church and he started to show me some of the lists of sins that God says are abominable and some of the people who would be excluded from the kingdom of heaven. And as he went through those sins, and then he also contrasted it to the way a disciple should live, and the fruits of the Spirit, and uh, what a true disciple is. And as he looked at some of those sins, he said, do you do those sins? And uh, I was being honest, and I said, oh, yeah, sure, I do. And I said, well, you know, nobody's perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do some of those sins. And he said, well, and he put the question to me in a way that no one else had ever had. He said, if the Bible says that a disciple lives this way, and you live this way, are you a disciple? And uh, I, I thought of a... You know, I, when I think of that story, I think of the part where uh, in Acts where it says some of the Jews were cut to the quick or they were cut by what they heard. Mm -hmm. And I was very much offended. And I said, and my reaction was to say, oh, yeah, I, I am. And he said, well, how? How would you reconcile it? And he showed me. And, and I had no answer for him. And I left that conversation being very offended, feeling how dare he... Uh, but although I, don't, I, never, I didn't end up going to that church and I don't keep in touch with those individuals, that man did me such a favor. He made me realize when I went home that I was living a lie and I was not a Christian. And I, and I knew deep in my heart that the way these men lived their life was different than the way I was and that there was something wrong with me. On him I, alone, I yeah. started to feel a tremendous amount of confusion over the next few months and uh, I started to have a tremendous amount of unrest where I felt that if I died, I would go to hell. I couldn't honestly tell myself that I would go to heaven if I died. I knew I was living a life for myself and why, and, and that I, I wasn't doing anything for God. Why is it that I should call myself a Christian when really I live for me? And uh, I had a growing and growing amount of unrest in my life around the same time that I was going through this I met a gentleman uh, in the police department where I was by this time employed and he was also a former Catholic and he started to show me things from a different angle than I had seen before where uh, con where he contrasted Catholicism with biblical Christianity 
And at first, our conversations were me vehemently defending Catholicism. Uh, I didn't view it as a shortcoming of Catholicism. I just thought they were my shortcomings, and I could just be a better Catholic uh, to fix these problems. And as we went further and further, I started to realize there were more and more things I could not defend. And I would have to just say, okay, well, you know, maybe I can't defend that one, but I could defend everything else. And every other day there was something else that I, a major doctrine I couldn't defend. And it culminated to a point where I just felt lost and confused. And I just begged the Lord to save me. And I said, I don't know what's right anymore, God. You know, please. Jesus saved me, come into my life, and I, I, I don't know. And it was at that time that I really trusted in Christ alone mm -hmm. for my salvation, and I gave up on my efforts to make myself right with God. I realized that something had to change. I didn't immediately realize that I had to leave the Catholic Church, but I realized I had to live my life different now. And if I was going to be trusting in Christ my, for my salvation, that I should live in obedience to him. And as I thought about it over the next couple of weeks, uh, I realized that now that I had trusted in Christ that the Bible teaches I should be baptized and that my baptism as an infant meant nothing. It meant nothing. So I got baptized and from that moment on, I never looked back and I left the Catholic Church that day and I told and I just knew that there had been a changing point in my life where I could never go back uh, when I went to get baptized I actually thought that after I was baptized I might continue to try to be in the Catholic Church I wasn't sure where it was going but the Holy Spirit convicted me and I, I thought of what Christ said, even though he was more talking about putting the law with grace, where he talked about trying to put old wine into new wineskins, and, and I felt that that's how it would be, trying to mix those two things. That old way of life was dead, and it never produced any fruit in me. And why would I continue to poison myself with mm -hmm. it? And uh, those were really my feelings, Richard, and I left, and from that moment on, I saw that in the next even in the next year that I grew more than I had in the previous 28 years as a Catholic and 13 years of Catholic school and that's what, and I really started to realize that uh, I, I had been damaged by many years. Did you begin to devour the word and you talk about growing in the faith were you hungering for the scripture and desiring to grow in knowledge of who Christ Jesus is? I had a tremendous appetite for the Word of God and for all things pertaining. Uh, I started reading through the entire Bible from beginning to end. Uh, I wanted to read all my time. I wanted it to be uh, dealing with uh, Christian type subjects. I would read Christian books and I would seek out uh, on the internet Christian sites and I would want to listen to Christian radio and I would look and I would discover Christian radio stations. For the first time I had no interest in doing this before and uh, I really really started to read the Bible more and more and I had a hunger for the Word of God for the first time in my life and God started to open my eyes to so many things that I had not realized before you know I, I often thought of uh, the verse in uh, Ephesians that where it says for by grace you are saved through faith and not of works mm -hmm lest any man should boast. Uh, but, you know, it's a gift, a free gift from God, and I thought of that where this is a free gift from God. And uh, I was dead to works, and I was trying to do it by works before. I reasoned mm -hmm. that I was a good person, and that's how I would get to heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, as a whole, I started to realize many, many of the doctrines. Uh, one thing I had noticed is the uh, Ten Commandments that had been taught as a Catholic were different than the Bible had listed them. And the second commandment is what was different. Uh, the, in the Bible, the second commandment is that we shall not make an image mm -hmm. of, of God or any graven image or any representation or bow down and worship it. And I realized that in the Catholic Church, they had kind of gotten rid of that 
uh, to, to hide it. And that was one example of something specifically that I realized, but there were many, many other doctrines I could go on forever. Yeah, that was one of the first things in my own life after discovering the authority of Scripture alone. It was the idolatry issue, and um, I had uh, removed all the statues from the different churches I was in, and uh, the archbishop called me to his office and you know, reprimanded me. And because we were good friends, he told me to continue, and you know, it was all right because we were good friends, but not to talk to other priests and not to make an issue of it, which I agreed to. I realized that the true power was in the Word, and the Word of God gives us the power, and that there's no power in the priesthood. Uh, it's really a, it's really an illusion. It's a power that they try to either knowingly or unknowingly make you think that they have but they they had no power indeed uh, they did not turn the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ in fact it was still bread and wine they didn't forgive your sins they, they didn't do the things that they said they could do and and I started to see that there's no place for the office of priest in the new covenant that the believers we're part of an eternal priesthood and Christ is the priest forever right yes, yes and this sacrifice that you know in mass it's a sacrifice that they have a weekly sacrifice they don't stand behind a pulpit it's an altar you know but uh, you know in the Bible it says for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who he has sanctified so Christ made the final atonement and perfected God's believers in that one time we don't have the, the priest there's no need for a priest to continually week after week make the sacrifice for the sake of the people as they did in the Old Testament they really followed more of an Old Testament idea than a New Testament yeah it's what the scripture says in um, Hebrews for example verse 7 uh, verse 27 of chapter 7 who needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's for he did for this he did once when he offered up himself and Christ Amen. Jesus said on the cross it is finished. finished it was a absolutely complete work legally done and finished and um, it's uh, actually uh, seven times that this word once is used by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, that the one sacrifice was once offered. I know that that has come as a shock to many, and I know some priests uh, who, uh, this was the turning point in their lives. For example, Sandy Carson, uh, in our book of uh, 50 former priests, uh, Far From Rome, Near to God, the testimonies of 50 converted Catholic priests. Sandy Carson in his testimony speaks about this verse changing him where he saw that it was once that Christ offered his sacrifice and that there's no priesthood in the New Testament it's the priesthood of all believers that's right. and that's a sacrifice of praise and worship it's not a sacrifice that is a uh, offering up of a propitiatory uh, offering to God I, I think the biggest problem overall is that the Catholic Church does not hold the Bible in a high esteem and their errors come from a lack of respect for the Word of God. Uh, they translate it in whichever way uh, their whims carry them and they don't let Scripture be the final authority. And I think specifically the one thing that I think is most damaging is the idea of apostolic succession. And this is where I believe the priests had this power that the Protestant pastors could never have because they were not in the apostolic line where the priests were and they had the power to forgive sins and do things uh, they would bless the water and it would become holy because I believe that they had some of these miraculous powers that some of the apostles had for a certain period of time in the early church and and and, and they don't there is no apostolic succession the apostles were given that power to make doctrine and write the word and it died with them there's no reason to believe that it continues and I, I never saw that and I just never realized I just never questioned it uh, and uh, and that's the same reason where by the mass 
I believed I was sanctified and I started to really feel that it was blasphemous that uh, the priest continued to make this sacrifice where the Bible says that Christ did that once and for all on the cross. I've often looked at uh, shortly after I left Catholicism I would read the 23rd chapter of Matthew I believe it is that's where for the whole chapter Christ goes on a sort of a tirade against the Pharisees and I look at I looked at that and I said I could easily in my mind make this where Christ would could be talking to the uh, the heads of Roman Catholicism today and the words would be the same he tells them at one point you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel uh, and the the priests and the Catholic hierarchy they're very particular with certain small uh, traditions or observances or doctrines but they miss the whole point of the Word of God the message of grace through Christ alone grace from faith is a gift uh, they miss the big message and they worry about these small traditions traditions of men and uh, the 23rd chapter of Matthew is very powerful in that application what would you say what is your message now to a Catholic person what I would say is I could very much relate to what you're going through you're stepping out on the ledge you're not sure where to look uh, your whole family is Catholic how would you explain to them but you know the Bible says that to this man the Lord will look to him who fears and trembles at his word God wants a broken and repentant spirit go to God in prayer and pray to God to show you the truth and guide you into truth and read your Bible and pray each time before you read it that God will lead you into truth and trust in Christ alone that he can save you and he can guide you into all truth and send the Holy Spirit into your life and if you just do that you'll see that God will draw you to him and will open your eyes to more and more things. Now Joseph when you were when you were a Catholic priest and perhaps even as a missionary priest uh, on the outside you were no doubt very convinced that what you were believing and teaching was true but inside, in the privacy of your own home and in your own heart, did you ever have doubts or questions about some of the things that you had been taught True. and were teaching others to believe? Oh yes, I was uh, always in, in doubt about uh, my own beliefs. In fact, I wanted to be faithful to my, to my church and to my vows, but uh, in the bottom of my heart, I had never been sure to go to heaven if I ever die. Because I knew, according to my theology, that if I commit a mortal sin, even after having lived uh, 50 years of faithful service to the church, if I commit a, uh, one only mortal sin, I go to hell. With my cassacon, with my uh, merits on, etc., I go to hell. And that was producing in my heart a great suffering, because I wanted to be sure. And the Lord helped me understand uh, what was lacking in my life. And I was very active in my missionary work and uh, the Lord knew that I was anxious about uh, my own security in front of the future that was ahead of me. I knew I would live forever, but what would happen if I die now? No yes. security of salvation. There was a fear of death then, wasn't fear it? Fear of death, oh, all the time, yes. I find uh, people, whether it's in Canada or Ireland, have a very real fear of death because of this issue. They're not sure about where they'll be in eternity after they die. But let's go back to that uh, time in Bolivia when you were there as a Catholic uh, missionary priest and you were there preaching and teaching uh, the, what you believed to be true and you began to listen to a Christian radio station uh, named Her uh, HCJB, Herald in Christ Jesus Blessings. Yes. Now maybe you could just tell the folks here uh, what happened when you first began to listen to that and what influence it had upon you listening to that radio station. Well, yeah, this is the, the turning point in my life. The Lord knew that I was anxious and uh, I, w I wanted to, to be faithful to Him and I was looking for a solution to my anxiety. So He brought me, not only in Bolivia, to listen to some gospel programs, but uh, He sent me to Chile 
this is the place where, in fact, I, well, I got saved. And how it happened, the Lord knew that I needed to read his book because the Lord had a message to give me. I had no time to read the book. I had so many activities to face, like uh, messages to do to my parishioners, uh, school. I, I was a teacher at the same time. I, I had some meetings. I was explaining theology to my people. I didn't have time to study the Bible, uh, to know what God wanted me to do. So he, he allowed me to be sick. You see, it was a very uh, wonderful time in my life. Well, it's not wonderful to be sick, but it gave me the occasion to read the Bible. And I got sick, I got it. And I, stand, I spent one year at the hospital trying to recover from that sickness. Many of my own companions died of that sickness, but I didn't die. Why? Because the Lord wanted me to understand something I didn't know. And during that time at the hospital, I read the Bible from cover to cover by myself for myself. And I knew God was talking to me at that time. And I, when I came back, I recovered, took my work again. And this is at th that period that H.E.J.B. came to my rescue. I listened to some verses. For example, I'll, I'll just give you one example of the kind of message God wants me uh, to understand. It was uh, from uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Only this, only verse that changed my life. He said, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, but uh, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And the missionary that was reading that quotation from the scripture on the radio station started to give a sermon or explaining the content of it, but I was a teacher myself. I was preparing my sermon for next Sunday. I said, I have no time to listen to a, a Protestant teacher to teach me what to believe. But there was a voice, there was a voice at the bottom of my heart that said, Joe, listen to him. So I kept on listening and I put my books away and I did this mission and he explained to me that God had sent his son who had committed no sin, that he might put my sins on his son, punish his son for my sins, and uh, so that I can be considered as justified in his sight if I believe the Lord Jesus Christ, what he has done for me. I understood something through the explanation of that missionary and basing his explanation on that particular verse that everything that I had done before to have a good standard before God on account of my merits, of my actions, of my religious activities, of my sacraments I had received, even of my priestly vocation, and action, the masses, the confessions, everything that I was doing that would be good for me, uh, in the sight of God, to let me enter into heaven. But I understood one thing here. God has put my sins on his son, and his son has accepted to die for my sins. It was a new truth, a new insight into the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that uh, never occurred to me to understand before. I understood more, and I got uh, uh, really affected in my heart. And one day I was just explaining to my people in my parish the famous quotation from the scripture in Matthew chapter 7 when he said, not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will go to heaven, but those who do the will of my Father will go to heaven. And, uh, and I will just quote that, that verse because it is very important. He said, uh, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that uh, practice lawlessness. Well, I was explaining to my people the fact that if they are saying, Lord, Lord, many times that would not satisfy God, and that would not allow God to let them enter into heaven, they must do the work of God. And even uh, I saw myself that, that in that description because I was casting devils out of souls. In fact, this is what the priests do when they give the absolution to a, to a penitent who comes to him for confession. He gives the absolution. He says, I, uh, in the name of God, I forgive you of your sin. It is the same as casting devils out of the soul. He, the Lord said, even if you do that, you will, I, you will receive from me uh, the, uh, the, 
declaration that I never knew you. Is it possible that after a long life of uh, sacrifice, God would say to Joe Tremblay, the priest Joe Tremblay, the missionary Joe Tremblay, I never knew you? And it was the first part of the message that God wanted to make me believe. He wanted to convince me, that's right, you're right, God. I am sure that if I die today, even with my castle on, even during the celebration of the Mass, you will not receive me because I, you will not know me. You will not know me because I am not your child. So I was convinced of that. It was negative conviction. When I was preaching that, I understood that the Lord Jesus wanted to point his finger on the situation of my soul. He wanted to convince me that I was a sinner, a sinner covered with religious uh, appearances. But I was a sinner. I was still in my sins, and I was under the judgment of God. I was convinced of that. And it happened during my sermon at that day. And I was so affected by this fact that God, uh, that I stopped my, my preaching right there. I didn't finish it up. It was the first time in my parish that the priest stopped a message halfway through. Because I was affected. I knew I was convinced, as I was under conviction, even after so many years of a very faithful religious practice, I was convinced that God would say to me, I will not know you. So I was asking myself, how can God change his mind about me? And I was in tears. And people also, they didn't know why I was, I was crying. They didn't know what was going on inside my heart when I was preaching to them. But the word of God applied it to my soul. I wanted to convince them they are hypocrites. But I got aware that I was the first, the worst of the hypocrites of the world. And so I just left uh, the altar. I went to my office. Another priest was celebrating the Mass. I was the preacher. And I went to my office. I just took my head into my hands and said, Oh Lord, what can I do? I would like you to say, I know you, instead of saying, I don't know you. So I heard a voice. And, well, it was one of the quotations that came to my memory. The word of God is powerful. Mm -hmm. And it, it came to my rescue at that period, uh, time. He said, uh, Here I am at the door of your heart. Uh, Revelation 3.20 mm -hmm. says, If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will enter into him, I will sup with him and him with me. I heard that life it, it was like like that, very almost physically. Mm -hmm. And I turned over, said, Where are you, Lord? Here I am, at the door of your heart. I am not inside yet. I am at the door of your heart. If you and let me enter, if you trust me, if you count on my, what I have done on the cross of Calvary, instead of counting on your sacrifices, if you make a change there, I will save you. It was really personal. Because he came to my rescue, he knew I was looking for security. Uh, I wanted assurance that if I die, I go to heaven, and I will receive a good uh, reception. I have a good reception. He will tell me, "Oh, Joe, come! I know you." This is what I wanted, and this is what I want to, to tell people today: uh, Don't count on your sacrifices, because uh, this is not the basis of uh, of your salvation. The basis of salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has done everything, and one of the things I have preached after that, I insisted on, upon the pe uh, on the people, on that idea that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross of Calvary, before he died, uh, uh, he said one word that convinced me of the whole truth of the Bible. He said, it is finished. As far as I was concerned in the Catholic Church, it was never finished, because I was counting on my sacrifices on the faithfulness to my church. And I was counting on, on merits I would acquire in order to have a better place in heaven. It was never finished. And the older I became, the more anxious I was becoming, because I was very fearful of committing a mortal sin that would send me to hell. Sure. From that moment, I was sure that the Lord Jesus Christ saying, it is finished, it was telling me, Joe, my suffering of the cross, has been accepted on your behalf to replace you. You can't face the judgment of God. It will be hell for eternity. But I did that on the cross of Calvary. And I trusted him. And I have peace with God from that moment. I have peace with God on account of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I changed my mentality. Before, I was thinking of my merits acquired by sacrifices, by good actions, by beautiful smile, patience, etc. From that moment, I counted on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is finished with him, and he, he, he accepted. And uh, when I got saved, I accepted not only the Lord as my Savior, but I told my Savior, from that moment, you will be my master. You will be my Lord. I will trust on your word to teach me on, since I have become your child. I have become a safe person. I belong to you. You will be my master. I will put away my theology, and I will take the Bible. One hundred percent, not fifty percent, like I used to do before. In fact, when I to opened my heart to my superior, he knew that I had problems. Uh, I stopped uh, celebrate, uh, uh, reciting the rosary because of a petition of prayer. Well, he called me, Wh what happened with you? Well, uh, I, I told him that I was not satisfied with my own spiritual life. But I uh, started to read the Bible, and I would like to apply the Bible to my whole life. Not only in my half an hour meditation of the day, but to apply my whole life to the Word of God. He said, yeah, you're right, Bible is a good thing, but be faithful to your church. I never knew what he wanted to say, what he, he, he intended to, to tell me. But I, when I opened the Bible after, ref, referring to the mass situation, I was celebrating mass the day after. One thing that struck me, they had taught me that the mass was the renewal of the sacrifice of Calvary without the shedding of blood, made for the, sac for the forgiveness of sins of the dead and of the living. This is why people play masses for the priest to celebrate mass so that the, the sin might be forgiven. Their sin and the sin of the dead person. I knew that. This is theology. Now I knew that and I came across a verse. You know the Lord is, is going to guide me out or guide me in more deeply. And that's why I left the Catholic Church. Not because my friends were not good or they were great friends. But the theology was producing anxiety in my heart. I had no assurance of salvation, and I was fearful to receive from God this condemnation. I never knew you. Now I was sure you would know me. But he, practically speaking, he told me once uh, from uh, Hebrew chapter 9, verse, 9, verse uh, 22. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Hey, it's a new thing. I have read that before, but I never understood it. So I went to my superior. I listened. I have something new to tell you. It is written, without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Why should I continue celebrating Mass if there is no shedding of blood? Oh, well, be faithful to your theology. Uh, don't stress too much. You don't understand. The Word of God is too big for you, for you have to understand. When it tells me that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, and you know what? I stopped celebrating the Mass. I stopped first accepting money to celebrate Mass. I said to the people, you give me, for example, five dollars to celebrate uh, High Mass. Why do you give me that money? Because I want to have my sins forgiven. I said, and listen, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. It means if I celebrate Mass, there is no shedding of blood, your sins will, won't be forgiven. You have to pay other masses, other masses. Yes, and that's why people will refer to the mass as the unbloody sacrifice. Unbloody sacrifice. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's let's just go from uh, from where you were at that stage to uh, the questions. There were more questions came up from your superiors, weren't there, Joe? Uh, and you had more questions for them, and you you found yourself uh, unable to remain as a priest and still believing the word of God. Yes. And my superior gave me permission. He knew I had a problem. And I came back to Canada, and after I told my superiors, after having uh, encountered uh, some Christians who met together to remember the Lord, not the way the, the Catholic people do in their Mass, but the way the Bible teaches. And uh, I wondered, where are the people of God today remembering the Lord? Because I was looking for that. I, I didn't want to be alone. I went to my superior. I said, uh, you know, Last week, I went to a gathering of Christians, and they remembered the Lord, taking the bread like the Lord has taught the disciples to do, remembering Him. And I found it very precious, and I think I will join them. And I said, uh, I, will, I want to retire from everything, uh, uh, to, to quit the Catholic Church, in fact. 
I wanted to be polite because I love my superior. He was a great guy. He helped me in every aspect of life. Yes. But uh, in, my, in my heart, uh, there was a conflict uh, in my heart. And so he understood it. Is he okay? Uh, just as we finish now, the last thing, what would you say to these people out there around the countryside of Ireland? What would you say to encourage them to make that step of trusting the Lord Jesus to save them? How, how would you encourage the people? Yeah, the expression born again comes from the encounter that the Lord Jesus had with Nicodemus. He told him he was a religious person. You must be born again. This man was a religious person. And the Lord can say to anybody today, to any religious person, you must be born again. If it means that that person in particular has not been born through the Holy Spirit, in the Catholic Church, I used to make retreat year after year. At the end of the retreat, one week retreat, they used, the preacher used to tell us, now you commit yourself to God and you are born again. I have been born again many, many times in my life. As a, but it was a, a theolo theological expression. Today they use the same expression. Mm -hmm. The charismatic movement speaks about born again believers. That, that's the way the man can talk about born again. Only God can make a, a person be born again. And he does it not 100 times during a lifetime. He does it once. And I face it. I was born again as a religious member of the congregation. When I was born of God, by the, uh, my commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, He put into me the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I am born again through the, whole, through the work of God in my life. If anybody wants to be born again, really, once and for all, you must trust God. Only God can produce the new life in our heart. It doesn't come from our uh, efforts. It comes from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he has done on the cross of Calvary. And uh, there is only one verse I would like to read on, in, in relation with that. We don't know how to describe the new birth that the Lord produced in our heart. But there is a verse that help me understand it, because God only can do that. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it is said, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This is the birth, the new birth that God produces in the heart when somebody, like it is said here, we trust the Lord after having heard His word. You hear the gospel, you must trust Him, and God does the rest. God puts the Holy Spirit in your heart and you are born again. Nobody can take off that new birth, that new life that God puts in your heart. This is the work of God. And that's why we call it eternal life. The, in, the, in my old uh, situation as a religious member of a congregation, they told me when I was baptized I had eternal life. But this eternal life is just eternal for the reason that if I commit a, com a, mortal, a mortal sin, I, will, I am sent to hell. Well, listen, I am sure that nobody who has accepted the new birth from God is going to go to hell. There is no child of God in hell. Go, those who go to hell, and, and there are many religious people there in hell that will be there, it's because they don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ, they didn't listen, they didn't believe in the Lord, they didn't let God put the Holy Spirit in their heart. We don't buy the Holy Spirit by any kind of money. We don't buy the Holy Spirit by good actions. We just trust the Lord and God does the rest. If you want to be sure of that, trust the Lord. Be humble. Accept the fact that you are a sinner and accept the fact that God has provided a Savior for you, a sinner. And the Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. And He can save you today. Welcome to the program this evening, I am happy to introduce to you a former Catholic who has a great love for Catholics. Yes, I'd say that, uh, especially in my early, earlier life, uh, we were more, as a family, devout in uh, uh, Catholicism. I was raised Catholic. Uh, uh, in my younger life, I can remember we were in church every Sunday and went to Mass and Communion. Uh, I remember my first communion confession 
and uh, different sacraments of the church. I was an altar boy uh, for probably about six years and mm -hmm. uh, served in the church. Um, I did go to catechism class and was instructed, you know, in religious education. Uh, it was more facts and figures. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't precious to me uh, at that point of my life. It was more something I did because that's what I was expected to do, and that's what everyone else did. And uh, it was more, I guess. Uh, unpersonal. I would have thought in my reasoning as a, a young person that that I had tried religion and I had gone to church and it hadn't done anything for me personally. It was more exterior, it was more something outside uh, like religion and it left a great void in my life even as a very young person. Very young I can remember saying you know there's got to be more to life than this. There's something mm -hmm. missing. Mm -hmm. and so I, it, I, because of that void in my life, uh, I begin to seek after drugs and alcohol and and uh, that kind of lifestyle sim simply because I was searching for something real, something that would make a difference in my life, something that would last and, and mm -hmm. work and mm -hmm. and uh, fulfill the the real inner need of my of my being. It grew much more intense to where there was some years of my life when. There was never a moment when I wasn't under the influence of drugs. And so I, I did get quite involved with hard drugs and with crime, with uh, alcohol, uh, riding with motorcycle gangs, and, uh, and a whole lifestyle that, that uh, I was searching and said there's got to be something more. And uh, so I probably went way off onto the left side of the base. Mm -hmm. Think back on it and know that uh, the grace of God spared my life so many times and uh, that God had a purpose in sparing my life and though I was so empty and so lost and so deceived uh, God's grace was still there to, to me as a lost person. I have to summarize I guess a bit here but uh, God had to bring me to the end of myself uh, Many of the things that I sought after disappointed me. And again, that question I had, where is it really at? It's like the world will, uh, the world and, and religion and, and, and the philosophies of the world will paint beautiful pictures. Have this or do that. And you'll be happy. And I'd go there and I wasn't happy. You know, it was like a mirage. I drank of many things, but I was still thirsty. And I, I tried many things, but one after another. I, if I can just have this or do this or accomplish that, I'll be happy. I, I became very discouraged and disappointed in, in all those things. And uh, I guess probably one of the giant factors in my life after riding with gangs and, and uh, I ended up in Florida. Uh, my brother, Leo, who was four years older than me and myself, took jobs on big farms in Florida and we milked cows, milked a thousand cows. And while we were there, we were kind of isolated from many of the influences we had uh, back home. And uh, my brother got saved. Somebody led him to the Lord, and there was a radical change in his life. And he was the first that told me of the gospel. And uh, he came to me and said uh, how he had been a sinner and he had gotten saved from his sins. And uh, he told me that I was a sinner. And that's where the trouble began. Uh, right there and then, and this is probably one of the giant factors of my life that's changed it. Uh, I said to my brother, I got angry, and said, I'm not a sinner. God wouldn't send me to hell. You can see how sin is very blinding. Uh, I, and my reaction was, I said, I'm not a sinner. God wouldn't send me to hell. I've never killed anyone. That was the only commandment I hadn't <laughs> broke. So I held it up and said, I've never killed anybody. God wouldn't send me to hell. I'm not a sinner. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, blind as it, I, it may sound, I was sincere. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. didn't think that I was really a sinner. But from that point in my life, for the next six months, God in his mercy, mercy 
It was like he shut a light off in my life right there and then. And before that, in a sense, I was like an innocent sinner. And if there's such a thing, we're all guilty. We're all doomed because of our sin. We're all separated from God. But God allowed my sin. Before that, I could get away with it. But after that, everywhere as I turned, I got caught. And my sin found me out from the piles of the past. It would jump in front of me. And by the time six months was up, I, I knew I was a sinner. God, the Holy Spirit, convicted me. And I, I didn't know what to do with them. I didn't know how to be saved from my sin, but I just began to, to pray to God, say, God, now I know I'm a sinner. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced of it. What should I do? I'll do anything, God, to get rid of this burden and this sin. But I didn't know what to do. Yeah, well, that is the essential part of the gospel. It really is bad news, but it's an essential part to know that you're a sinner. It was just in reading the Bible in my own life that finally I got convicted that Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 is true. You being dead in trespasses and sins. And I said, there's nothing good in me. And I've always said how good a person I was and how good a priest I was and, and then how good I was at searching into the Bible as a Catholic priest and as a charismatic priest. I was wrestling with more the fact that I wasn't a sinner, trying to justify myself. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother was a brand new convert, undiscipled, didn't know how to share the gospel. And so I didn't hear the gospel during that time. I, I, had, never, I had never read scripture, never heard the Bible, nobody ever presented the Romans Road. So uh, I guess God allowed the darkness of my sin to, to show me uh, how lost I was, and uh, I didn't have any hope. I would say the, the very pivot point and factor of my life, although God was working in my life during those days for about six months, was that finally my brother invited me to go to church. And um, uh, for the first time, uh, I was 20 years old, uh, I went to church after many years of uh, not being in church and as I went to this church service uh, I rode in on my old 1940 Harley with my long hair and my leather jackets and chains mm -hmm. and um, when I got to the church I got off my Harley my brother still had his Harley he had rode in on a chopper and, and uh, some people came out and they the first, they walked up to us came right out of the church and I remember them reaching out their hand and shaking their hand and saying, we're glad you're here, come on in. And as I went into that church, I saw people like I'd never met before. They were happy. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember meeting, you know, said, we're glad you're here, sit down. And they begin to sing hymns. And the old words to those old hymns, the, the power of the truth, you know. Yes, yes, and, yeah. Uh, they would stand up and give testimonies of how Christ yeah. saved them. And, yeah, yeah. And, uh, there was something different about them and uh, the whole place and surrounding. And uh, I heard the gospel for my first time. Yes, yes. Preached, or preached the gospel. Yes, uh, yes. It's been 28 years ago, but I remember that message clearly right now. Well, what was, can you remember parts of the message? Shall Very I, much what, so. You will tell me. I, I might know that the listener wants <laughs> to hear Clarence. It was a clear yeah. and concise, about an eight-minute message on mm -hmm. Psalms 23. The preacher said, the Lord is my shepherd. And uh, he said, who is yours? Who has been leading your path? He said, he leadeth me. And uh, he said, uh, who has been leading your life? And I realized it wasn't God. Mm -hmm. That the path that I had plotted, I had led my own. And it had led me to a lot of sorrow and a lot of regrets and a lot of shame. And the Holy Spirit helped me see. I, my life was a mess because of my sin. That was a problem. And mm -hmm. I had been... That was my choice. Mm -hmm. And I had gone the wrong direction. But God was calling me, I'll be your shepherd, mm -hmm. I'll lead you. Mm -hmm. He said, he leadeth me. And he talked about the green pastures and mm -hmm. beside the still waters. And then he said, he restoreth my soul. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew when he was talking, my soul needed to be restored. Yeah, it was filled with sorrow and brokenness and regret and 
sad stories and, mm -hmm. and uh, loss and emptiness and mm -hmm. the darkness of sin. God shined his light of conviction upon it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was carrying that burden and uh, he talked about the uh, restoring of the soul and uh, how if you come to Christ as your shepherd, he said, he lead, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Yes. He said, there can't be a shadow unless there's a light. And he said, Christ is that light. You know, yeah. He'll take you through, even the dark places. And yeah. By the time he got through with that eight-minute me message, all I knew was that I was a sinner. And they said, Christ shall save you. If, yeah. you'll, if you'll receive Christ and him alone, it, it's Jesus plus nothing. Amen. But yes. if you'll come to Christ, Yes, it's yes. not being good enough. It's not trying to get rid of your own sins or making your life better. But if you'll come to him, yes. he's the good shepherd. Yeah, yes, yes. You know, he'll, he'll lead you in those paths. He'll meet you where you're at. And they gave him a gospel invitation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't care who was there. Yeah, yes. I was that. I was that. I was the one. <laughs> I knew I was the one control. they were talking to. Yeah, yeah. God smote my heart and convicted me. And I was prepared. I just went forward. And there I... I knelt and trusted Christ alone for my salvation. Yes. There's been times when I've been disappointed with myself, but <laughs> I've never been disappointed with the Lord. He's never let me down. He's been faithful. Uh, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, mm -hmm. even to the end of the world. You yes, know? yes. Just, uh, God's been so good to me. Yeah, I guess at that point of my life, uh, when I rode out of that church, I didn't have any big experience. I didn't see any stars or uh, rainbows. But uh, as I rode out of that church, I was on my Harley. I was going back to the farm. Uh, you know, the Bible says that God's Spirit shall witness to our spirit. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I knew is that my sins were forgiven. And I remember going back to the farm to milk the cows that night. Uh, I said to my brother, you know, for the first time in my life, I feel clean. I, I'm forgiven. And I told him the statement. I wished I could have kept it, but it was my heart's desire. I said, I don't want to sin no more. Praise God. Yeah, you yeah. see, when you turn your back on something, it's, you know, that's true repentance. You, you don't want to do it no more. God changed my heart towards mm -hmm, sin. Mm -hmm. And so I was a farmer. I just began a new farm, my brother and I, at that point. Uh, we had rode into that farm. My brother was just newly converted. And um, uh, I just became a Christian just as we were beginning that farm. And uh, so I went back to milk the cows. All our neighbors, they didn't know. Here we were. They saw us ride into town on our Harleys mm -hmm. with long hair. And, and uh, they said, uh, we'll give them six months <laughs> and they'll ride out of town. But uh, what they didn't know is that you know, God had came into our lives, both of us, and we began to base our life on the Bible, the Word of God, and uh, began to make decisions accordingly. And uh, Jesus said, if you continue in my Word, you'll know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And mm -hmm. uh, as I continued to, I didn't change all at once. The exterior was the same. Mm -hmm. I had the long hair, I had the motorcycle, but I began to carry my, I got me a big old Bible. I began to carry it with me wherever I went on my Harley. <laughs> and, uh, I had a joy in my heart that I still have that has never gone away. That just I, I love to tell people the old, old story that changed my life. Uh, because, uh, you know, one step at a time. Yeah, you know, yeah. as I had cares like you were expressing. Yeah, yeah. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your cares upon him. Yeah, yeah. He careth for you. And so uh, uh, these things began to go in my life, the drugs, the alcohol, came a point when I got a haircut, you know, and uh, God began to change my life as I got, became part of a local church and uh, uh, began to get involved in Bible studies and studying the Word of God. It, Jesus said, if you continue my word, you'll know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And a lot of those things, just one step at a time, it didn't all happen at once, but uh, I remember saying, well, once I quit this, then there'll be nothing between me and Christ, you know. And uh, he graciously gave me joy as I let go of the old and God brought forth new. I had a burden from the very moment that I received such the great, greatest gift of all, 
the gift of God, eternal life, to, to help others to, to realize the joy that they can have. They're searching, like I was, many people, mm -hmm. saying, where is it really at life? What's the meaning? What's the purpose? Got to be something more. Now, what about your family, your parents, you know, you were growing up Catholic with them as Catholic. Did you tell them the good news that... Oh, it was good news to me, but it wasn't to them at that point of their lives. Yeah. Uh, they were disappointed, they were hurt that I would uh, uh, leave the church and uh, look to anything else but the church. And uh, that's the way I was raised. And, and uh, there came a point that they were happy to see the changes in my life, but there was some friction because of... Uh, 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 out of the changes in my life, uh, uh, I changed the church that I was going to. And uh, uh, there came a point where I had to leave off. And uh, my dad, he cried. He said, well, I wish he'd come back to the church. And, but there came a point in our lives when, when after I went to Bible college that uh, I was able to see them come to church. I made a deal with them. They said, I invited them to come. My dad said, if you... He said, well, why don't you come to my church? I said, well, I'll go to your church with you uh, this week if you go to my church with me next week. And we made a deal. We did that for several months, and they heard the word of God. And I couldn't change them. I had to leave off. We couldn't talk about it too much. Uh, but, you know, God knows how to work in people's lives. And got a hold of the heart, and they were converted. <laughs> Praise and, uh, God, yeah. And uh, God did some great things. In were they the quite life. elderly at the time? Or? Yes, my dad had spent 70 years in the mm -hmm. Catholic Church at that point. And, uh, but God gave him another, uh, uh, another about 18 years mm -hmm. uh, of life and he left a good testimony, passed on to glory uh, mm -hmm. last February, but uh, uh, my dad left a good testimony of, of faith in Christ. Praise God. My mother also. What I really would like to communicate to that person is that, you know, there is a great difference between religion and a relationship with Christ. That many times, uh, like in the Old Testament, people went to the temple to try to find God. But it didn't work. You know, uh, the Ten Commandments were written in stone. And they stood against people and condemned them. But God said, there's going to come a day when I'm going to change this. I'm going to write my commandments in their heart. And that's why God sent Christ to meet you right where you're at, is that uh, he is Emmanuel. That's why we have Christmas. Uh, God with us. Jesus came. He's God with us. And that he came, not so we have to go to the temple to try to find God, but so we can become the temple. So Christ can come in our life and uh, that the, the commandments wouldn't be written on stone but they'd be written in our heart mm -hmm. God give us a new heart new spirit that if you truly get uh, the gift of God eternal life if you receive Christ that's what he came he came to save us from our sins if you uh, put your faith and trust not in a religion but in your in the Lord Jesus in a relationship with him and he's your savior that you'll never be the same Amen and amen, yes. God will reach you right where you're at. He yes. can transform your life. Uh, he can pick up the broken pieces. There's no life too broken for God's love to repair. Now, Jacqueline, you were 22 years a nun. Uh, when was it that you decided to become a nun? Well, Richard, um, I think all my life, especially being taught by nuns, uh, I was very impressed by them, and I just... I guess I was searching. I wanted to uh, to do God's will. I wanted to be holy, or maybe just follow along with what you know. Uh, I was just very impressed by the nuns that we were taught by, and even at school when we were in high school, uh, we would be asked, you know, what do you want to do with your life? And I'd always say, I want to be a nun. We were going. We were concentrating more on his passion. Yes, yes, Richard. We were, the motto was to adore, repair, and suffer. We were to adore the precious blood, make reparation yes. by our life, by um, leaving our families, by living behind grills and walls, 
uh, to make reparation for the sins of the world. We had a scourge, we had a whip that was made of um, uh, iron thongs, you know, and we would uh, beat ourselves after, um, after the midnight hour, after we used to get up, you know, during the night to chant um, the office. And then after that, maybe a few times a week, we would have the discipline, we called it the discipline. The discipline, actually beat yes. yourself, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, Richard, I just accepted it as, you know, this is what I wanted and this is what... This uh, is what you were doing. This is what it is, yes. Yeah, yes. And that it was saving souls and, um, I guess, glorifying God. Yes, yes. Well, I would, I would be going to confession once practically every day, yes. or every week. Um, and we had a um, very wise chaplain and he said, Sister, this isn't necessary, but I want to... Once I knew what grace was, that grace would, you know, give us more of the infilling of God, I said, well, that's what I want. So I would yes, just keep yes, going for yes. more grace and grace. Yes, that, that, actually, I, at one stage, and it wasn't for very long, I used to go to confession every day, and some of the priests got really annoyed with me, too, because I said, if this is the way I'm filled with sanctifying grace, I want yes. more and more. Mm -hmm. And even though I, I may only have little, little venial sins, I want to... Uh, confess them so that I get more and more of grace. Mm -hmm. So in that sense we were quite similar. Did you really think or experience that you were getting holier and knowing Christ Jesus better when all of this was going on, Jacqueline? Never. Never, yeah. Well, was Never. I was getting more depressed, more... I just didn't know what was wrong. I, I was just... I just felt empty. Yes, empty. yes. Like yes. I was just reaching, reaching, reaching all the time for God and, and just could not attain it, couldn't attain what the, um, uh, the sanctity that was expected of us as nuns. Yes, yes. You, know. you are searching and searching and still empty and empty. Mm -hmm. And I have found that from speaking with other former nuns and other former priests and... I was... Um, somehow I got the, uh, the spiritual canticle of St. John of the Cross. Yes. And a few of the nuns, we were, we were discussing that, uh, how to reach transforming union. And then I really believed that I had reached this transforming union and, uh, you know, the very height of sanctity. Yes, yes, yes. So it makes you feel higher than anyone else or higher than all the nuns. And yes. Well, um, a cousin of mine who was a Christian would come and she would visit us and she would tell us about uh, all Christian teachers and um, then one day she brought a, a minister, Protestant minister, to the convent, and, and he said that he was doing a, um, having a, uh, like a seminar, a, um, outside of the Catholic Church, I don't remember. Yeah, around, it was somewhere around the convent. It was like a street meeting. A street okay, meeting. he was street he preaching. Was gonna, yes. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. So I asked permission to go, and um, my superior then, She's dead now, but she was um, very into the Lord, very much so. She was she, seeking herself, was she? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And she, uh, she knew that I had problems, that I was really um, depressed physically, spiritually, and she let me go. And I heard the gospel. He was telling us that only by grace were we saved. I said, God, I don't know what she's talking about, what he's talking about, but um, I accept it. Yes, yes, yes. And that it wasn't by works, it wasn't by rosaries or church membership, um, but only it was a gift. Now, uh, you go back to the convent. Um, and then I stayed two more years. You stayed two more years. Now, what are you doing in those two more years now? Because, you know, you know the Lord and, uh, you know, you, you have uh, you know, gone beyond emptiness now to mm -hmm. you know, experience His presence and trust on him alone. Were you having difficulties then? Uh, Still, because um, I was trying to, to get into the Bible. I always loved the Word. Yes. But yes. we weren't actually taught it. We weren't, you know, given uh, the real theological um, summations of the Bible. You know, it always had to be interpreted for us. But after two years, I realized that I could no longer uh, live under the authority of the superior or the Pope, but just the authority of, of the Jesus Christ or the Bible. So I left, and um, here I am after 27 years. 
I guess the Holy Spirit was just working in me to just leading me, leading me out. Should I had looked upon God as so unapproachable and I feared him so much because I had to go through so much physical illnesses and I always thought that it was his will that I suffer. So I never, it was until many years after I left and then um, through counseling, through a studying the word, um, studying the, the history of the Catholic Church, that, I, that the Lord in his great mercy uh, brought me into a knowledge of himself. You know, um, I did not lose that fear of him immediately. Well, the one, the one scripture that helped me so much when I, when I left was in Hebrews, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I just trusted in the Lord for, those, for 27 years. It's, Christianity is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's not a religion. It's a oneness with him. It's knowing his word, it's, it's living life with him and in him. It's um, accepting the wonderful gift that is offered to us that he did on the cross. He did it all. And it was finished. It, it's, it's for us to just, he bore it so that we can walk free. Yes, yeah, so we can rest us. on it. And that, that I don't think you could have said it better Jacqueline that 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 oh. is it it's to rest on Christ Jesus it's not mm -hmm. any work mm -hmm. or endeavor it is to say I rest on mm -hmm. what he did mm -hmm. his perfect life his perfect sacrifice I mm -hmm. rest on trust on what he accomplished we grew up in a fairly devout Catholic family I grew up in my childhood um, I went to a public school our public school allowed us to go to religious instruction classes one period a week. They wouldn't dismiss us. We'd go across the street and we would meet with the, with the priest and also with the nuns. So we were grounded well in Roman Catholicism doctrine. Uh, we were, of course, we kept the, the sacraments of the church from being baptized as a baby and on through with, with communion and confession, uh, being confirmed. We had our, made our confirmations classes and were confirmed. And so, and as we watched the other kids, but we would go to the church. We had a little parish not far from really where I pastor a church. Now it's kind of interesting, but we would go to our, our little church every Saturday night or Sunday morning, whichever seemed to fit our schedule for the, for the particular week. And we would sit through mass after mass, and we never got to know the people, and it didn't really seem to impact our life. Um, it was something more of a, of a ritual, I guess you could say, that we did. We would go to church. We would do our We'd go to the confessional, usually before we'd get there like an hour early, go to confessional, come home, come out, do our penance. And then, of course, in the time of the Mass when you had the communion service, uh, you would partake of the, of, the, of the Lord's body. And we did that week in and week out. Uh, the kids that we were grew up with just seemed to be ordinary as everybody else. It's just that we went to church, and, and we really thought that every time when we went to church, our sins were being washed away. And then we could sin that week, and then we could do the same thing the next week, and our <laughs> sins would be washed away. And this, this thing just kept going on, on and on and on and on. I probably stayed faithful to that till I was 15 or 16 years old. Uh, then I moved away from the Catholic Church, like a lot of young people do, even in true religions, they move away. And I moved away and be, began to dabble in worldliness, and sin in my life was increasing. I wasn't getting more godly. Uh, I started working in a mill. I ended up working on a 3 to 11 shift, and uh, I would do my laundry every Monday morning. Monday morning was laundry morning. So I got all my clothes gathered together, and I headed for a laundromat uh, down here in town and put my laundry in all the machines. And then I went and sat down, waiting for the wash machines to finish up. And there was a round table there, uh, and there was a gospel track on it. gospel track is simply a little piece of paper that tells you, it has some Bible verses in it, and talks about how you can know Christ as Savior, how you can be reconciled to God. So I picked that thing up and I read it, and one of the first phrases in that gospel tract that caught my attention was, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I understood that I had to be born again to see God, 
but I had never heard or didn't know anything about this phrase, born again. But I knew if I wasn't born again, I was in serious trouble. Uh, so I read on. And as I read that gospel track, I realized that I was a sinner before God. And that Jesus Christ paid my sin debt, and that I must repent to him and trust him and exclude everything else in my life to save mm -hmm. me. Well, after my laundry was done, I gathered my laundry up, I went out into the pickup truck, and there in that parking lot, uh, I just simply bowed my head and bowed my heart before the Lord and said, Lord, I am a sinner before you. I acknowledge my sinfulness, and from now on, I'm trusting Jesus Christ to the exclusion of everything else in my life to save me. What I meant by that was I was no longer trusting my baptism, I was no longer trusting my penance, I was no longer trusting communion to wash away sin. I was simply trusting the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. Well, yes, I grew up as a Catholic, very, very devout family. Uh, my father was an atheist, however. My mother made sure all five of us went to church, and we did so regularly every night on, during Lent, and did the Stations of the Cross, and also grew up in a Catholic school. So very well indoctrinated. Had no doubt that Catholics were the ones to go to heaven and the only ones to uh, make it there. Um, as I grew older, though, and moved away from home, got into college, got involved in the world and those activities, the Catholic Church I didn't feel like I needed it anymore, didn't need God on that personal level, wasn't really sure that he really all was that, that personal, wasn't sure that really Jesus was God and just went the way of the college philosophy and that, that whole worldliness. During that time though, my heart was heavy, it was empty. I just was sad, really felt that something was missing. Uh, would go through minor periods of depression, maybe three, four days, and I just felt like something was gone, was wrong. Um, then I started reading a book, and the book was a survey pretty much of the Bible. Through that, the Word of God was there, and I really did come to believe again, yeah, God is personal. Yes, Jesus Christ is actually God himself, and that fits so well in my Catholic doctrine. So bit by bit, my whole Catholic belief was reconfirmed, and I was getting excited and thought this was really, really great. So as I continued reading, though, the author talked about sin and our own decision to sin and what that does and how that... Um, puts that separation between us and God. Sinners by nature, yes, but a recognition of the fact that I had personally chose to sin and I was under serious conviction. It was serious. I think maybe for a period of maybe 15 to 30 minutes before I received Christ as my Savior, but Brother Richard seemed like in five years. years. <laughs> yeah, it was awful. Yeah. At that time, I, I went to my mother, who's Cat the, the Catholic one in the family, and told her that I just, you know, Jesus Christ was coming back again and that I wasn't going to go to heaven. And she looked at me confused and said, You've always been taught that Jesus is coming back and, and that he's died on the cross for our sins. I said, Yes, wow, wow. And I couldn't explain it to her. I had sinned. So she encouraged me to go back and read the book. I read a couple more pages, and in there was a invitation, an actual invitation to receive Christ as my Savior because he had died on the cross. Well, I put the book down and got on my knees and asked Jesus to come into my heart, and he did immediately. I got up. I was elated. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was wonderful. Went back and told my mother, oh, but Jesus is coming back again. <laughs> well, uh, being raised in a, in a Catholic home, uh, for me was, I mean, it, it, was, uh, it was wonderful because I have wonderful parents. So, uh, so growing up uh, uh, as a Catholic was basically something that um, took place on Sunday uh, for an hour. 
Uh, you basically went to church. Uh, you did that with your family. And, um, and that was the extent of it. I mean, I, I have, um, again, great parents. I mean, these, you know, moral parents, wonderful, loving parents. Uh, so it, my upbringing and my years uh, being a Catholic uh, were uh, just, I guess, kind of, we'd say, academic as far as Catholicism was concerned. You went through the programs uh, that uh, the Roman Catholic Church laid out. Everyone else was doing it, so um, it was kind of uh, the thing to do. Uh, for the most part, all my friends were, were Catholic, so we... Um, uh, you know, we went through communion classes and um, you know, confraternity uh, classes in the uh, I guess sixth grade. It was so it was a lot of it was a lot of fun um, as far as being mean, meaningful, uh, spiritual in that sense. Um, not really, but uh, but as a young you know person growing up in the uh, 60s and 70s, um, that's the way. It was. Uh, so I would say, and then getting older, I was a, a, a nominal Catholic. I, you know, quote, believed in God and kind of thought I was a good person and um, uh, went to church. Yeah, got older, didn't go to church as much, got married, have children. They get to a certain age, you start bringing, you start bringing them to, ch you know, to church and kind of going through the same thing. So um, that's kind of, you know, my... Um, Catholic, you know, experience. It wasn't any anything particularly um, good. It wasn't anything particularly bad. It was just kind of something that you did because that's what you knew. Yeah, but when when did the Lord <laughs> break through? Brian? Well, when, when I got older, uh, I, in in my thirties, uh, is when the Lord started working on my heart, and and that's when He began to draw me to Himself. Uh, and, it, and it was at a point in time uh, in my life where um, the Lord used circumstances to bring me to him and then to bring me to a point where I knew that I had to, to totally trust in the Lord. And that's the point when the Lord convicted me of my sin. I knew I was a sinner. I knew that I wasn't, quote unquote, a good person and that I was going to be okay in my own self-righteousness, uh, that I wasn't going to be with the Lord, I wasn't going to a place called purgatory. The Lord convicted me that I was going to be eternally separated from Him, and He convicted me of my sin, and I knew the only way to make that right was by repenting of my sin and trusting in Jesus Christ. Was it in reading the Word? Were you reading the Bible? Or how, how did the Holy Spirit actually penetrate into your life? You know, no, I really wasn't reading the Word. I did read the Bible maybe about five years before that. It was basically on a challenge. Someone asked me what I was as far as what my belief system was. And I, of course, responded, I'm a Catholic. And they asked me a really tough question. They said, why? <laughs> and here I was at 31 years old, and I didn't have an answer. And the person said to me, he goes, well, you're 31 years old. Don't you think you ought to know why you're a Catholic, why you, you claim to believe what you believe? Well, that did get me reading the Bible. But when I finished it, I kind of clo closed it. And I remember the one passage that I took out of the scriptures was, you know, what you do to the least of these you do unto me. And I was like, I found the loophole. I'm going to be okay. I treat people okay. I'm nice. I give to charity. So I closed the Bible and that was it. I thought I was okay with God. God's not going to send me to hell. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm again, quote unquote, a nice guy. So that was my, the extent of me reading the Bible. Um, and then it was at that point, five years later, when, you know, those I guess, seeds that were planted in reading God's word, uh, God took that, and five years later, God convicted me of my sin, and by His grace, um, He saved me. And um, it, it was, you know, it was, it was absolutely an incredible um, uh, moment in my life where I went from spiritual death, I went to spiritual life by God's grace. And at the time, you don't. You don't fully understand what God just did. 
he doesn't make you an instant theologian and, and all of a sudden you know, you know his word through and through. He, he saves you as a, as, a, as a babe. He saves you as an infant. Uh, and he saves you, uh, you know, to himself. And at that point is when the blinders come off and you now have a heart for God. And I remember the, the immediacy of having to know this great God, this great Savior, that just saved me by his mercy and by his grace. And I knew it was absolutely nothing of myself. This was something that I couldn't have, have, have done, couldn't have earned, couldn't have even figured out. This was something that, for whatever his reason and his sovereignty, that he bestowed his, his saving grace and mercy on me, the only thing I can do is just bow before him and, and, and thank him. And I'm sure you had a great desire to read the Word. Not now, now you are reading your Bible. Yeah, I, I, wanted, I, wanted, I wanted to know this God. I wanted to know this God that just saved me. And at the time, there was absolutely nothing in me that said, okay, I have now been saved by God's grace that uh, I'm not going to be a Roman Catholic anymore. That did not enter my mind. Uh, what entered my mind was, I wanted to seek the truth and I wanted to know God and he put it on my heart and mind that I was going to find him in the scriptures and I always fully thought that I was going to find my Catholic faith, my Roman Catholic faith in the, in the scriptures. scriptures and that's when the, the journey began of seeking God's truth and then having to decide where the truth was. Well when did the moment come where you saw that you could not continue in the Catholic Church, that things were incompatible. When was that? It was about 10 months after coming to faith of going to, um, a, uh, going to Catholic Church every Sunday. I was going, I began about a month after coming to faith of uh, going to a non-denominational Christian church. So I was going to a church twice on Sunday. <laughs> and. Um, and then going to a Bible study, actually at another church, at a more conservative, reformed Baptist church, and actually comparing the theologies of Roman Catholicism, um, basically like free will evangelicalism, and reformed theology. And I just kept praying to God uh, during this time, Lord, reveal your truth. I'm not looking to sign up with another church to leave the Roman church, to go to a Baptist church, or to go to a you know, a Pentecostal or a, you know, a, a Lutheran church or whatever. That wasn't my, um, that wasn't my goal. My goal was to seek the truth uh, through God's word and go wherever it, it led me. And that was what was on my heart, was to seek the truth because that's the only thing that matters. And constantly through the word, the Lord Jesus Christ says, thy word is true. Yes, that, that is... That is the ultimate. When you reach that stage that you know that God's word is truth, then you have a foundation. I know my own life as a priest was 1979, and I actually had come to Vancouver in Canada and across the border, and I was in Seattle, and I discovered the truth of God's word. And that text and the Lord's word, scripture cannot be broken, were priceless to me that I had reached the stage where I knew that there was an authority that could not be gainsaid. Well, I can say that my life was similar to Brian's. Uh, we did grow up in the same community. Um, there was really not much of a difference as to how we held to our Catholic roots. We were born Catholics, we were raised Catholics, and we were Catholic. That was basically how easy as it was. Um, and, uh, you know, we did the same thing. I remember early my mom used to take us to church every Sunday. Uh, I have two brothers and two sisters and uh, six of us would sit there in the pew. My father was usually absent, uh, it wasn't something that he did normally. Um, and we would go through the, uh, our church uh, time and then to catechism classes. Um, but like in our family also though, we didn't really speak about it during the week. There were other things to do. So our religion was really on Sundays. Um, got exciting around Easter time. It was a time that I really, really enjoyed because I got to sit down in front of the TV and watch King of Kings and, and uh, one of my favorite shows as a child and kind of play out the part uh, of some of the characters uh, as a child. Um, and I knew as a child that I had just a love 
for what Christ did. Although I didn't have a great understanding of it, um, as I do now, and what it really meant. But I knew there was a Jesus Christ. I knew that there was a God. How it was all put together as a child, I really didn't know. But I knew that it all came together on Sunday at church. Um, I was ignorant toward many of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. We were never really sat down and taught uh, each teaching. Um, I don't think they're really, you can do that because there are thousands and thousands of doctrines, catalogs, and dogmas that nobody would ever be able to sit down and, and understand. But the basic things of Catholicism we knew. And I think the most basic thing was that you had to go to church. Um, and you had to be a good person. And uh, with that, you had to go to confession, which is something I really never did as a child. Um, I would say that I did. Uh, but something in me always fought the fact that I believed that you had to confess to God. It wasn't something that was told to me, but deep down I just said to myself, why would I confess to another person when I could sit in my room and do that? And I knew the formula usually was uh, uh, a few Hail Marys, Our Fathers, and a, a couple other prayers. And as a child, I figured, well, if I know the formula already, well, then that's great because I'll just do it myself. Um, so this is how I grew up. Uh, we didn't have a Bible in the house. I never really uh, looked at the Bible. There was never a Bible in our Catholic Church um, anywhere to be found. Um, in catechism classes, we were never given scripture. We were never taught scripture. We were just taught the sacraments and the way of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, there wasn't much emphasis put on it. It was something that you did, basically. Uh, we had volunteer teachers, and, and that's, that's pretty much how uh, we went about every day um, as Catholics. And I'd like to skip over time. Um, because nothing really changed that much. As I got older, it got less, you know, um, more time with friends, less time with church. Nothing was really important as much. Uh, we grew up, my mom wasn't really um, taking us to church as much because now that we were out of catechism classes after we had taken uh, communion and confirmation and whatnot, we were pretty much on our own, so we weren't doing it as a family anymore. Um, and time went on. and. Uh, I guess I could say that I always had um, a closeness to the church, and I always did find myself going to the church, but it was always for the reason of being that I knew I had to make up for something. Um, you know, any bad things that I ever did in my life, and there were some things in my life that I, you know, questionable things that I knew were wrong in God's sight, um, but, you know, I was taught that get to church on Sunday, you know, confess to God, do good things, and you can make up for it. And, you know, that's how you want to leave it. And I guess I used to have a problem with that because I never knew what would be the last thing that I would do. Because if I've done a bad thing and I get to church and then I'm, I'm okay, well, how long does that last? How long am I okay? How long after I take my communion um, and receive the Eucharist um, am I okay? How long does that last? How long does that formula last? Well, it must be only a week because we had to do it again the following week. And if I missed church, then, well, that was kind of bad because then I had two weeks where I needed to get that fixed, I guess, and make sure that I was okay again. Um, but what had happened if, if um, I had died and I didn't have that fixed? So there was always that question of how many times do I have to do this to get it right? And that always sat inside me as, as, as something that I just never could understand. Um, but I was never shown the way to find the answers. Um, take it to about uh, the year 2000. Um, uh, here I am, a 37-year-old man, married to a beautiful wife, um, who is now about to deliver our first daughter. And at the time, I had a successful career. Um, there was a lot of stress that went along with it, but something inside me, I, I started feeling a change. There was a lot of anxiety. Um, I knew my life was changing. I had promised myself that when I was a child, um, and I had been, I guess when I grew up and I decided to have my own family, that I wanted to be the best father that I possibly could, and I was questioning myself, what type of lifestyle do I have to live to do this? Um, and there was a lot of questions, a lot of anxiety. Um, 
so I left my job. I decided that I needed to do something a little bit less stressful so that I could be on this path to being a great father. And I started getting uh, more anxiety as days went on. Uh, left to myself, I decided that I needed to get closer to the church. And this is where it all started. Yes, the dedication that I asked. Yes, I, I basically said, you know, God, if I'm going to become a good father, a good husband, then the only way that I believed to do that was to be a good Catholic. Well, how can I do that? Well, I started working a new job in New York City. And right when I would get off the subway, there was a church right there in the corner, about a block away from where I worked. It was perfect situation for me. So every morning at 7.30, I would be in the church, and I would go through a mass, I would go to confession, and then I would go to the basement of the church where there was an abundance of statues of saints. And I had a ritual that I followed each and every day of kneeling before each and every one of those saints and saying a prayer. Um, some of them I didn't even know. I didn't know the history of them. But I was always taught that these saints are intercessors. They were going to get me what I needed. They were going to get me where I wanted to go. I felt great. I watched other people praying before them, kneeling before them, speaking to them, leaving novenas to them. And I did the same thing. And this lasted uh, for a couple of months. But there was just an uneasiness still. I, I was so empty as to where I was supposed to be, what was going to happen. And I used to pray every day, Lord, I just need you to show me the truth. Just reveal it to me. And little by little, things started happening. I found myself one day walking into a Christian bookstore. And I picked up a book on a shelf and I started reading it. And uh, at this time, again, 37 years old now, I never knew the differences between Catholicism or any other religion. I just thought to be Catholic was the way. I'd never had a Protestant friend. Everybody I grew up with, everybody I knew, we were all Catholic. So I started reading the books and they were all focused on Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I've never really focused on Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I, I never knew what that was. I focused on going to church. I focused on doing good things. I focused on saying uh, the Hail Marys, the Rosary, all of these things. For five years, I was a catechist in my 20s. Um, where I, I taught 10-year-olds the catechism, the sacraments, and I thought that that for sure was going to take away all the sins that I might have committed as a child or teenager, teenage years, older years. And um, even when I did that, though, when I sat before those children, I saw in front of me not children that, that were going to learn the program that I was given, um, it was purely uh, unbiblical. It was all geared toward Roman Catholicism in, in regards to the sacraments, in regards to the things that you needed to do as a Roman Catholic. Again, at the time, I didn't understand those differences. I do now. Um, I spent more time teaching these children how to be human beings growing up in the world that we are and how important it is to love each other. And I, I thank God that I did that at the time because um, I believe that they've got a lot out of that, and I hope that they did. The teachers that were there, the priests that were there at the time, um, I loved them dearly and I still do. Um, but here I am back again at the age of 37, struggling, and finally I, I, I picked up a Bible one day and I started reading it. And one of the first verses that I read was um, Luke chapter 6, uh, verses 46 to 49, and I could read that right here. Um, and why call ye me Lord, Lord? and do not the things which I do. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built the house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that was without foundation, built in the house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. And at that point, I said to myself, God is speaking to me. My house needs a foundation. I'm about to have a child. I'm, I, 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 I'm a husband and a father, and my house needs a foundation. My life needs a foundation. What was that foundation going to be? What was the rock in there that Christ was talking about? Well, obviously, he was talking about himself. And it just hit me, and it clicked at that moment that this isn't about me. 
This isn't about the Roman Catholic Church. This isn't about any church or any institution. This is about Jesus Christ. If he's the foundation, I've got to find out what he did. How is he my foundation? What things do I need to know about Jesus that can assure me that he is my foundation? And I started reading the Bible, and I started praying even more for God to reveal his truth to me, and resources started coming my way. Um, Richard introduced Brian earlier. Brian and I grew up. Um, we never really knew each other very well growing up because I was more friendly with Brian's brother. But when I had found out that Brian had left the Roman Catholic Church many years earlier, I had called him up one day and asked him about that uh, situation. And we spoke for a lengthy period of time and realized that uh, Brian belonged to a church that I had visited uh, a couple of weeks prior. And um, he, Brian had invited me to a Bible study. And through Bible study, uh, through prayer and resources that came my way, I started realizing who my Lord and Savior was. And I started realizing that there is nothing at all that I could do to save myself, to make up for the things that, that I did wrong. It would be a whole life of constant struggle, of making up for things, of, of trying to do what I couldn't, what Jesus did. And that was to, to, to be a substitute for me. And I could never be a substitute for him, myself, or anybody else. And that other verses started appearing before me as I'm reading them and, and it is as if the Lord just opened my eyes to his truth and no longer was the Bible something that was just kept in a closet. It was a living, breathing word that every time I read it was like a river flowing. It was just incredible how I could spend 10 minutes on one verse and, and just see how God is speaking to us. You know, he says to us, that, you know, it is according to election, that election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. Well, who calleth? It is God that calleth. It is not of works. It is not of anything that I could do. It is God's mercy. For it is grace that I have been saved. These are the things I've never known before. I never knew what grace was. I never knew what it meant to be saved. I never knew what it meant to be born again. To be born again to me was a concept that was so out there if anybody ever brought that concept to me, I would think, well, a born-again Christian, well, isn't that a cult? Isn't that something that you belong to and now you can't have birthday parties, you can't have this, you can't have that? No, I learned that Jesus Christ said you must be born again. doesn't mean that you must join a cult, you must be uh, somebody that you're not. It means that you must be regenerated. Your heart must be regenerated, and that's what happened. So you grew up yeah. as a... Uh young Catholic boy, I presume? Yes, my family is Italian. All my uh, grandparents came right from Italy, and um, they uh, were Catholic. I was baptized into the Catholic Church as, uh, as an infant and, and grew up in the Catholic Church. Uh, then, uh, as my life went on, in fifth grade, my parents uh, decided that I needed to get out of public school, go to Catholic school, and of course, then as a teenager, according to the times the church had, um, I went through confirmation. I, I, but, you know, it still wasn't anything that, uh, that did anything for my being right with God, my being any, any way, shape, or form holy before God. It just did not. We learned uh, all of those things. I was a, uh, an altar boy and a choir boy and... Uh, you know, served uh, the Mass so that I also learned Latin and uh, was able to, because in that time the Mass was in Latin and not in the vernacular that they use today, but Full I was work. very faithful to it. Mm -hmm. I uh, took it as a, an honor and a duty, and, and um, so I would be assigned to the, to the 6 o'clock Mass because they knew I would show up. Uh, they'd always have two boys, but they... Um, you know, the other boys never show up. I was the only one there, so, uh, and they would put new uh, trainees with me so that uh, I'd cover for them, make sure that they stood at the right times or rang the bell at the right time or yes, any of those yes. kinds of things. And, uh, and you more represented that really devout uh, element, and I think that it's good to emphasize that. And uh, As I was 
getting into my senior year of high school, and I was attending Most Holy Rosary High School, Catholic school, uh, uh, the uh, the teachers, both priest and nun, could not answer really a lot of the questions that we had, and there, there was real confusion in my mind. At that time, they were uh, teaching a, a theistic evolution, that God started it all, and then he let evolution take over. Yeah. and and um, so in my senior year, I really had come to the point of rejecting uh, the, the teachings of the church. It just uh, did not satisfy me. I know that there were times when I would have just received communion and that Eucharist would be dissolving in my mouth still as I'm exiting the church. And, um, you know, someone would step on my toe and I would curse them with that same mouth that I you know, had just had taken that, that bread into my mouth. And uh, there just were so many ways that uh, sin was entering into my life. And, you know, God seemed to be nowhere, uh, nowhere close. So I eventually did go on to uh, the rock and roll scene. I went on to be a hippie. Uh, that was the era that we lived in. And so uh, whatever people would think of as a, a hippie, I was a hippie of the hippies. As Paul <laughs> says, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Whatever your mind thinks of for that era, I, you know, that was that's what I was. And uh, so... Uh, uh, you know, all the sin that went with it, all the ways that uh, I lived, uh, it was just a terrible thing. Uh, I did get into the alcohol, and uh, uh, by 19 I was a, an alcoholic. I was uh, drunk uh, more times than I was sober, and uh, it's just, just incredible kinds of ways that um, uh, I just lived wicked. Yeah. The, uh, hippie life had me working with a, a man that uh, had, as a, as a landscaper, that had driven uh, uh, race cars. And then from there I uh, decided to get a degree in landscape architecture, which landed me a job with the government. So I had to clean up my hippie uh, look and life a little bit, not a whole lot, but some, uh, to work for the government. And there... Uh, but through that, I met uh, a man. So uh, I went to this church, and I was amazed. It was just incredible. And I heard for the first time that uh, Jesus Christ did everything on the cross, that uh, nothing that I could do could add to it, and uh, that if I would repent and uh, receive him as Savior, that I could have... Uh, my soul right with God and, and have a place in heaven. Wow, that was something, something that you did not want to hear, I presume. Well, <laughs> I didn't in, in the sense that there was in me still enough Catholic theology and Catholic upbringing that uh, I'd have rather have heard that if I could have climbed, you know, a hundred flights of stairs on my knees and bloodied them, uh, doing that to get myself right with God, I would have done that. Or yes, if yes, I'd have yes. served, uh, you know, somehow, some way to uh, to work or earn my way to heaven. But uh, that's not how God operates. I went to all of those, so I kept hearing uh, more and more of the Scripture. And of course, God tells us uh, in His Holy Bible that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so six weeks of uh, attending this church, uh, I kept hearing uh, over and over that God loved me enough that he sent his son, that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I just kept hearing that kind of thing. And I uh, was a, a fair enough student in, in apologetics when I was in Catholic school that I could argue a lot of things back and and all, but I realized that I really was arguing myself into hell, and uh, that's what I deserved, and uh, uh, that I was just continuing to push uh, Jesus Christ away. And I, so then in those six weeks of hearing about Jesus Christ and what he had done, I just came to the point where I knew that uh, my good works weren't going to amount to anything. God doesn't have scales in heaven where he puts sin on one side and my good works on the other, and that weighs out no all, one of my sins would outweigh any lifetime of good I could do. That Sunday afternoon uh, in uh, December of 1973, I 
bowed my head and there prayed, confessing sin and repenting of it and repenting of trying to get to heaven my own way so that I'd be able to boast as scripture says and uh, and I repented of those things and and uh, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ that day as my Lord and Savior and what a change that he did in my life incredible load of sin lifted off from me by his grace too we are able to be freed from the hold that sin had on us and to begin to live as new creatures in Christ and yes. that's just the what the scripture says of any man being in Christ he's a new creation did you really uh, apprehend the fact that you were a new creation or am I going to live it too fast uh, no I, I really did uh, that night that I went uh, home um, I, I emptied out all of my liquor I flushed all of my drugs down the toilet I uh, burned all of my pornography magazines, I uh, got rid of all of those things and uh, uh, I mean it was just an amazing transformation in my life. I know that not everybody's is, is that uh, exact but uh, for me it, it just uh, those desires were all gone. I really truly was made a new creature in Christ and, and, uh, and then I also had a desire to read the Bible. I just could not get enough reading of God's scriptures that uh, he's preserved for us so uh, I just was amazed at uh, at what God had to say in here well I I just want to uh, make sure that everyone understands that uh, the Bible says that where grace I'm sorry where sin abounds grace does much more abound and uh, so no place is hopeless no person is hopeless uh, no one at all uh, can be rejected if they'll come by repentance and faith uh, to God in God's way. And so uh, it's uh, very important that you understand uh, if you're looking at this right now that uh, whatever it is in your life, sin, uh, hopelessness, loneliness, uh, whatever kinds of things, uh, God understands to forgive and he wants to forgive you uh, but you have to be willing to be honest before God. You have to say to God uh, right where you are that yes indeed you've done things that this Bible would call sin. Uh, you've uh, lied, you've stolen, you've had anger in your heart toward people, you've uh, you know, committed adultery in your heart if not in actuality. Uh, some ways uh, you've uh, been idolatrous in thinking that you're better than God, whatever it might be. Uh, that uh, those things are called sin in the Bible and I know because that's how my life was. I, I did all those kind of things and, and uh, yet uh, God uh, does love us. He does want us to go to heaven. That's why he sent Jesus Christ to come and uh, be made flesh and dwell among us and, and then to die in uh, a terrible death on the cross for our sins and shed his blood that we might have uh, everlasting life and that, not only that but he was buried and then rose again the third day according to the scriptures for your sins and uh, so I would just say to you be honest and real before God and come to him and say to him God yes indeed I'm a sinner I've done these things and I've been trying to uh, please you on my own and work my way to heaven and it's it's just not working it's not going to do it and uh, I realize that because Scripture says that Jesus Christ paid it all on the cross, he said it's finished. And uh, that I come before you and, and I put my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior and in him alone. Nothing else, not what I could do. No church ever went to the, to the cross. It wasn't a church that saved me uh, from the hell I deserved. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And and uh, just cry out to him as a guilty sinner deserving of hell and receive him as your savior uh, trust in him uh, put your faith in him believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved Acts uh, uh, 1631 tells us and so if you would do that you would find uh, the same eternal life the same peace with God you'd be made right with God and that's your real heart desire 
you probably don't understand that, but that's what you're seeking for. You have a God-sized emptiness in you that only He can fill. And if you'll turn to Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Righteousness of God in Him, we may be clothed in His righteousness. And it is enough to bring tears to your eyes as it is to yours now. <laughs> You really have been convicted and you really trust on Christ and that you really are born again yes. by the Spirit. How was it after that? Uh, I felt like a completely different person. Uh, the things that, the sins I had committed prior to that really didn't convict me as much as now <clears throat> I, uh, with the conscience being opened by the Spirit of God. Now all of a sudden, you know, we talk about little sins and big sins. All sin was equal. There was no little sin, there was no big sin. And uh, I became convicted very easily and uh, confessed my sin straight to God as soon as uh, the sin was committed. I mean, I didn't become sinless, obviously, but my desire for holiness grew. My desire to trust Christ more grew, my desire to grow in grace grew, the, the things that I did, the, the, um, the works that I did were no longer done to earn God's favor, but they were done as if to say thank you. Um, they were a, um, a result yes, of the yes. salvation. We had uh, one more child, but we had a few misses in between. and. The amazing thing about it, though, is uh, with the relationship between my wife and I, because we're both Christians now, is that before, if something bad happened to us, we would question why. It just it didn't make sense to us. Why is God angry with us? Why is He putting us through this? And it was later, after we both uh, committed our hearts to the Lord and, and by God's grace he opened up our heart to believe the gospel that we viewed things differently than that God as a loving heavenly father does all things good and probably the passage that is most precious to me is in Romans chapter 8 verse 28 where Paul says and we know that all things work for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose and I realize that that purpose which the next verse talks about is that we be predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And I thought, what a great purpose. And there's no one I'd rather be like than Christ. And that's the purpose that he's working through in our hearts. And so when things began to happen, like my wife, I believe, had roughly three miscarriages before my, my youngest son was born. And where in the past it would have been devastating, now we say God does all things good, all things well. And that if, if this happened, then it was for our good. Yes, it's a whole different mindset where you see yes. things from God's point of view and as the scripture speaks, you know, and, and that all things work for good. I know I've fallen back on that. Romans 8.28 text yes. many times and the, the reason for Romans 8.28.29 that we will be conformed, mm -hmm. shaped more and more like to Christ Jesus. What would you say to that Catholic person now, the present time? Absolutely. One of the things that I would say is the greatest question that anyone can have answered in their lifetime is how can a sinner be made right before a holy God? And the answer to that question is probably the greatest answer you'll ever hear. The person who responds, the reason I'm going to heaven is because I'm a Roman Catholic, needs to understand that it was Christ himself who gave himself as a sacrifice for sin. Uh, it is not whether you belong to a denomination, whatever denomination it may be, whether you're Roman Catholic, whether you're Lutheran, whether you're Baptist, whether you're Presbyterian, or any other denomination, for the denomination did not, was not nailed to the cross. Some people say, well, it's my faith that saved me. Well, your faith was not nailed to the cross either. It was Christ and Christ alone. The, probably the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16, uh, the Gospel according to St. John says, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I am so happy today to be able to interview a former Catholic who had spent many years in Catholicism and now has a great love for Catholics to reach out. And uh, it's lovely to have you, Will, on the program. I remember briefly as I grew up in the church, you know, going through like the Stations of the Cross and that having a very deep impression on me, um, you know, feeling bad for Jesus that he suffered the way he did. And uh, I had a very good relationship with the priest there. Probably one of my fondest was a gentleman named Monsignor Echo. And he was very well loved in the area and in the neighborhood. And um, that was my earliest recollection. As yeah, a Catholic I, re boy. I remember thinking to myself what it might be like to be a priest. Because I felt that uh, even, in, even in my earliest years, I remember having a desire to know God more personally, and I would do anything within my power to do that, and uh, and I thought that perhaps by becoming a priest, that might be the avenue to to fulfill that desire. And uh, can you remember the day of First Communion itself? Do you remember what it was like going up for First Communion? Uh, can I, remember? I remember I was very nervous <laughs> uh, and excited at the same time because for me, it felt like I was taking the next step of drawing closer to God and um, being afraid to make a mistake and and then after taking the wafer and the juice I, I felt like something I, like I had received uh, forgive me if I say this you know a scout badge or something like that um, that I was just that much closer to God and then from then on I could be one of the people that received that, that went forward to receive that, and I was very excited. In thinking back on why I became an altar boy, it's, it's, it's hard to remember. I do remember, though, serving as an altar boy. Uh, again, uh, as I stated earlier, you know, I desired to have such a close relationship with God, and I was working towards that. And so this was just the next phase, and I'm trying to remember how I was approached. Uh, in becoming an altar boy because obviously, you know, and, and I don't know if there was a line of young boys that wanted to do this, but I know I had a desire to serve and to be closer to the priest because that was the, the place to be because he was close to God. And so um, I remember wearing the robe, you know, going in the back, being, it was special for me because I felt I was different than everybody else. I felt that I was somehow, and you'll have to forgive me, that much closer. What are your memories of being holy or pious? Mm. And uh, mm. the, were you a holy, pious young boy? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, how in, did it in my show? own eyes. How was, did it show? Uh, <laughs> well, it uh, early, uh, it started with uh, reading the or saying the rosary. I remember I would sit for hours in uh, my favorite rocking chair and I would rock back and forth and I would go through the rosary. And I would try and do that as much as possible because, again, I felt that by the amount of time I spent in, in saying the rosary that God would be pleased with me. My, um, and again, I don't know how many other people think this way, but my, my early impressions of uh, how I felt that God would judge me was I pictured, and, and of course, you know, you've got to consider the fact that I was a, a young child, <clears throat> that there was an angel assigned to me and there was a big chalkboard and one side said good and one side said bad and he would put a chalk mark next to what was good or put a chalk mark next to what was bad and I felt that the more good I would do and, and part of that was saying the rosary um, that that would outweigh the bad and that in the, in the end when I faced God on judgment day that he would tally up the, the count and, and hopefully... Uh, the good would outweigh the bad, and, and then he would let me into the kingdom. And uh, I would I would go to service every day. It would be like I'd get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, walk across the street and down the hill to the church, and I would sit in service, and I would pray to God and ask him to help me to be a good 
Christian. And then later in that same gospel, the Bible says, he that has the Son has everlasting life. He that does not have the Son, the wrath of God abides upon him. So we come into this world then as sinners before a holy God. We are already under God's wrath. It's not that one day we'll stand before God and God will outweigh our good with our bad, as I spoke of earlier with the, the angel and the chalkboard. We're already on the negative side. We're, we come in not only with our own sin, but with the sin of Adam. And because of that sin and because of our nature, the Bible says we are by our natures children of wrath. We stand before a holy God condemned. And yet God in His gracious love and in His mercy, the Bible says that God demonstrates His love and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. It is all in Christ. And therefore in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, those who are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The condemnation is removed because the Bible says that it is Christ himself who bore God's wrath on our behalf and the person who trusts Christ alone for eternal life, who believes that Christ took their place on the cross at Calvary, that Christ bore their sins. God recognizes that as having been done in their place and he accounts them as not guilty, justification. You are not guilty because Christ has borne your penalty on your behalf for you. And the, the beautiful transaction is in justification that, number one, your sins are transferred to Christ, and number two, his righteousness is transferred to you, and God sees you as righteous in his sight through Christ Jesus. When Peter and John stood before the, the Sanhedrin, and they, they told them, they, they adjured them not to speak of the name of Christ. And they spoke back and said, we must obey God rather than men. And the, the fact of the matter is, uh, you have to ask yourself the question, is it your love for your own personal um, uh, welfare or your love for even a church or your membership more important than your love and obedience for God. Uh, we talk about the Ten Commandments. And I have come to the conclusion that all sin is basically a breaking of the first commandment, which is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So anybody who, who has a heart that says, well, I, I desire more to be um, to healthy, more to be uh, comfortable, rather than have to give up everything for the sake of what you're saying, well, what you're actually saying then is you're breaking the first commandment because you love something more than God. You have an idol which needs to be removed. It is good to be with you again, and I am really happy to be able to interview somebody who was, has been in Desert Storm and served as a Marine in going to Bosnia. It has been a desire of mine for a long time to interview somebody who has been involved in these recent conflicts, and particularly somebody who has a heart and a desire to reach out in love to precious Catholic people and comes from a Catholic background. So I'm happy today to introduce to you Ralph Di Cosimo. Uh, and Ralph, I'd like to ask you something of your background as you grew up. Sure, I uh, grew up in an Italian-American, very Catholic family. Uh, I was baptized as an infant, raised in the Catholic faith. Uh, I went to Catholic school from the time of kindergarten. I received uh, my sacraments in the way which I was supposed to, uh, penance and uh, communion in second grade and uh, confirmation. I went on to uh, a Catholic high school, and uh, I would have considered myself very much a devout Catholic, even after. Mm -hmm. In thinking back on uh, my life and growing up as a Roman Catholic, and uh, you know, praying to saints and to Mary and um, others, 
it's, I, I realize now that really I, I never really read my Bible all that much. I trusted those who were in authority to teach me the truth and, and I took their word for granted. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we did not, of course, read the Bible either, but we uh, did read the uh, Catechism, you know what I mean? Yes. Uh, and we memorized the Catechism. Uh, I remember uh, memorizing why we prayed for souls in purgatory, you know, in the Catechism. It's a holy and a wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from their sins, was the answer, you know? Well, as I, I grew older and I began to hang out with, uh, you know, the other teens and everything, and uh, we would go to church on our own, uh, we would, uh, instead of, because in the, as you grow older and you, you begin to um, hang out with the, the other teenagers, they seem to cloister in the back. And so there was a spot where the teenagers hung out in the back that was the cool area. And so we didn't really go in to uh, sit with the, the other members. We would hang out in the back and, you know, we would, as long as we were there, that's what was important. And uh, earlier, uh, I was in the choir. I didn't mention this earlier, but I had a great time. I sang with the choir in the back of the church, but as I got older, I felt you know, a little more embarrassed as a, as a young man. Uh, it, it wasn't cool. So I stopped doing that, and then I hung out with everybody in the back. But um, as I began to grow and question things and actually start to listen to the service as it went on, I became disheartened with not so much what was being said, but what wasn't being said. So I know that now you're in ministry and you preach and teach. Yes, sir. So um, when did you actually you come to biblical salvation? Was it some years later that you really saw what salvation was? And can you explain what it was like when you saw in the scripture um, what salvation really is, you Absolutely. know, what the condition, what is our condition before God and uh, how it was that the Lord showed you the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Could you explain uh, that? It, uh, we move all the way up to when I was 19 years old and um, I was doing carpentry and uh, working for a contractor, uh, building homes from the ground up. And there was a gentleman there that uh, we would talk about things. And he would ask me questions, simple questions like, you know, do you believe in God? I'd say, yeah, sure, you know. And, uh, you know, I, at that, even at that time I thought it was foolish not to believe in God. And so he would, his questions became more and more personal to the point where, you know, he asked me if I knew that if I were to die, today that I would go to heaven and I said well that's not up to me that's God's choice I don't know I don't know if I'm good enough I don't know if I'm bad enough not to go and I said that's totally up to God not up to me and he said well that's not quite true yeah and so he began to share with me certain things that I'd never heard before and we hung out and it was later on um, that I began to visit other churches other than Roman Catholic churches. Uh, I became curious. And so I, uh, I, I went around the, the gamut of uh, the different churches I visited all, anyway, anywhere from, from Pentecost to the Charismatic to conservative Baptist churches and so on. But uh, at 19 I visited a church and I heard the gospel message for the very first time. And at the end of the service, uh, the gentleman asked us to bow our heads and close our eyes. And he said that uh, if there's anyone here that doesn't know if when they die they're going to heaven and would like to know, raise your hand. So I raised my hand. I was an honest individual even then. And a uh, gentleman took me down in another room and explained to me the gospel. And uh, typically today we call it, you know, the prayer of salvation. I prayed and... Um, to be honest with you, uh, at that time I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and even though I prayed the prayer, I felt like something happened. But I did not live a life according to that confession. Well, I think it's so important that you say this because there are um, so many people who have, um, you know, um, 
done the same sort of thing they've gone through sort of a ritual and they've said the sinner's prayer yes. and uh, they wonder why it didn't take it was like <laughs> and I think from from Catholics uh, you know that you know are searching and looking uh, that this can be deceptive you know whereby a church as it says all you've got to do is come forward make your decision yes. uh, sign the card say you've accepted Christ into your heart and everything and it's uh, yes. And I struggled, even as an unsaved priest, with the very same thing of false professions where people, you know, have been led into sinners' prayers sure. and uh, where they have not been genuine. So I, I'm really happy you said that because we do not want uh, precious Catholic people to uh, be told that, you know, all it takes then is to say the sinners' prayer and, you know, now, now yes. we have another ritual. That we yes, I in, know. And I it's know. not... It's not, so it's good that you said that. So how yes. eventually did you get convicted before the All Holy God that uh, you really were a sinner because he only saved sinners? Absolutely. And how was it that by God's grace through faith that you really were saved? Yes, well, that's pretty interesting. Um, it was, I would say from that period on, from when I was 19 on, after I, I mouthed the words to the sinner's prayer, that uh, I began to feel convicted. It was almost as if um, the door to my conscience was finally open, and and I believe it was at the age of 25. I couldn't take it any longer. The um, the conviction I felt for the lifestyle I lived and and sinning before a holy God bore down on me so great that the the climax came one evening that uh, I was reading my Bible <clears throat> and the Lord just brought it out uh, so uh, illuminating the fact that if I were to die that I would suffer an eternal torment in hell um, because I rejected God, I sinned against the Holy God and that at that time God revealed to me that He was offering Christ's sacrifice on my behalf to pay the penalty for my sins that Christ I understood that Christ's whole life was lived in obedience to God on my behalf and that his sacrifice was to pay the penalty for the sins in other words when I looked at the law the Ten Commandments which terrified me my whole life you know, I talked about the angel with the chalkboard, and I looked at the Ten Commandments as the great equalizer, and I saw that Christ's life was lived to obey God on my behalf because that was something I couldn't do. He did it for me, and not only that, did He obey the law, but also He took the law's penalty on my behalf that the soul that sinneth shall die. And when I understood that, when the, the light, I call it the light of the gospel, broke through on my conscience, it was then and there that I bowed my heart to God and believed that Christ had done it on my behalf. He, his, he was my substitute. He took my place. I deserved to, to be on that cross. It should have been me that was whipped. It should have been me that was crowned with the thorns. But it was Christ who did it on my behalf. I'm sorry. He that knew no sin became sin yes. for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Christ Jesus, who knew no sin, He became legally sin. Yes. He took our sin upon Himself. Like the Apostle Peter said, He took our sins on His body on the tree. Yes. Why? So that we might become the 